and you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral, and it's full of fish, and a sea turtle comes by. Now, this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. It is governments that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean, but also support system. We are not talking about something that is apart from us. We are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. So these 10 years are probably the most critical in the history of humanity. The most accurate measurements of changing oceans will come from space. While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter. Um, this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long recon, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration. We eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of uh, Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change 
in the, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest mega cities are located at the coast, and this number will double. In, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So, uh, it, knowing how much level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious. Uh, it's obviously a major goal uh, for, for human beings. Coming up from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change. But how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your Green in Brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 
11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. One of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a, a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system system. So that would significantly reduce and, and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a, a possible option when, when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. 
and engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too, and that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. Marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. In the coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement based concrete, e concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna, plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We are geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, E-Concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed, to create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. 
What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. And this is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in case of a coral, it will die, and then another coral will sit on it, and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete, though, is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products company are certain their products are better for the environment and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage to the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. Business Week. Inside from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. We got there. You know what day it is? Friday's Eve. Oh, there we go. We're almost there. <laughs> Thursday, August 19, 2021. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovic in our interactive broker studio, also on YouTube. Uh, stocks off the lows, erasing earlier losses. Big can tech. Can we say buy the dip? I guess. I think we can. That churn higher just continues. It does. Yeah. Especially, you know, look, I, I think retail traders went in and it looks like they bought the dip. Exactly, right, because we've seen some pullbacks and yeah. some names. Uh, I'm actually going to mention one. Netflix has been on a tear. Uh, I think it's up four days in a row, five days in a row here. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about that, talk about the market. Investors kind of flip-flopping away from worries over that withdrawal of Fed stimulus, the virus spread, and more. It is amazing how we go back and forth on that. Coming up, though, not so easy. A tough story, Tim, on food inflation and tough choices for families around the globe. Yeah, it's a current issue of Bloomberg Business Week in 
takes a look at several different countries where families are experiencing the rising cost of food. It's a heartbreaking story. Also talking about Facebook's metaverse. It Aren't is we there? Coming. Isn't We're not this there. the metaverse? This is the beginning of the metaverse. We Mark need... Zuckerberg would like this to be the met metaverse. We could do a headset, yeah. right? And we could be anywhere. Yeah, we could be anywhere. We could be with all of our listeners together. And if it was Charlie and he had a headset on, I think he'd be on a cruise somewhere in the Caribbean. Yeah, I'm just I think guessing that's, Charlie I, I, I think that's where he would be. We got, we got Doug Krisner right now at the oh, latest when it comes to business right. news. Thanks hey there, for Doug. saving me, Tim. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Yeah, you right. might be on a cruise ship too, yeah, Doug No, Christmas. I doubt that. Charlie worked the early shift. He's out of here. That's <laughs> right. He is gone, and I'm in for Charlie, and uh, it's a mixed picture for the stock market right now. It was a very choppy beginning to today's session. A lot of the economically sensitive stocks are lower. You guys touched upon uh, the dip buying idea and uh, maybe a little bit of anxiety over tapering. Consider the situation in China, though. We've got uh, a lot of those Chinese-listed firms here in the U.S. The ADR is trading lower. The NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index is down more than 4.5% today. The bright spot, Macy's, rallying by more than 20%. It seems like some of this may be a bit of a short squeeze after the department store operator reinstated its dividend. Macy's also raised its sales guidance. So if you back up, look at the major uh, measures here. We've got the Dow down about four-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 has kind of been fluctuating between gains and losses. Right now we're down, but the loss is less than a tenth of 1%. NASDAQ comp pushing higher by about a tenth of 1%. And as long as we're in the NASDAQ market, let's mention uh, Facebook shares trading up about a half of 1% right now. Short while ago, we learned that U.S. antitrust officials have refiled their monopoly lawsuit against Facebook. You might remember last month, the federal judge dismissed this case, and he said the FTC basically failed to support the claim that Facebook has a monopoly in the social media market. Ten-year Treasury right now yielding 1.23 percent. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Doug, you snap on a headset. Where would you go? I don't know. That's a good question. Ah, okay. Well, I'm still a little nervous about international travel. Okay. Uh, I got to confess to that. I don't know where I would go. In the metaverse, you don't have to worry about that. Well, you just, you just do it in virtually. the comfort of your own office or your home. <laughs> All right, Doug Krisner, thank you so much uh, with the Bloomberg Business News Flash. Let's get to that market driver's report. And let's set the Business Week agenda on this Friday's Eve. Dave Wilson in the house, stock editor at Bloomberg News, Inter Interactive Broker Studio, along with Michael McKee, international economics and policy correspondent at Bloomberg News. He's got kind of Jackson Hole Eves almost. I, I'm ready to go. I don't know where Doug's going. You got your cowboy hat? I'm a, I, I, got, I have like six cowboy hats. Of course he does. Cowboy, hat. cowboy boots? I just boots? have to decide which. Yeah, well, a couple pair. But You're do you, ready. Do you wear them in Jackson Hole? Oh, of course. I love it. <laughs> I love it. You're going to have to share with uh, Tom Keen and Lisa Bromowitz, like everybody in hats and boots. Well, if you see those two in hats and boots, I'd be surprised. Then we know. A couple uh, of city slickers there. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. <laughs> um, the sky maybe felt a little bit like it was falling a little bit earlier, um, Dave. You know, we were a little bit lower, um, but we've seen investors come come back into the equity market. Yeah, and then kind of drift away, which yeah. would tell you why the S and P five hundred is lower at the moment. You know, technology stocks really kind of popped up uh, as the day has gone on to provide some support to the market. Beyond that, though, it, it's like you've got a standoff between the more defensive areas of the market, which are higher, and the more economically sensitive areas, which are lower. Uh, because you go beyond tech in the uh, 11 main industry groups in the S&P 500, you see consumer staples, food, beverage, tobacco, utilities, health care, real estate, all class of defensive type investments. And then in terms of what's down, energy really notable on that score, uh, the index off 3.5% for that group. Then uh, raw material producers, financial, industrial companies, uh, all down more than 1%. So, you know, there's your standoff. Wah, wah, wah. Hey, Michael McKee, uh, for a fourth straight week, the number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits declined. Uh, take this with the context of what we heard from the Fed minutes yesterday, the ju late July meeting. Is this substantial further progress? Is this another indication that we could start seeing some tapering by the end of this year? It's an indication, yes, not a substantial indication because this is people who are not working and the Fed is concerned with people who are working. But it does give you an indication that things are getting better. We're now down to 
uh, just about pre-pandemic levels in terms of initial jobless claims. And I suspect this is a little different situation. We're not seeing people going on unemployment because they've lost their jobs because mm. companies are laying people off. It may be they're going back to work and their companies have closed or don't need as many people or, or whatever. Uh, but the numbers have come way down, and we're getting to the point now where we can say it's, it's not as much of an issue. Uh, the, the unemployment side, now the, the getting people into work has been a problem. You know, it's interesting. I was reading something out from Dow Jones and saying that the Fed tapering has already been cut, and they're taking a look at the growth uh, of the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and so I'm just curious, is the Fed going to count on the markets to some extent? Has that? Do you agree with that in terms of uh, the growth of the balance sheet? Maybe not as much as it was when it began. It's uh, quantitative or, or, or it's buying of assets. Um, I don't know. Has it already begun? I, I looked at that. What do uh, you think? Yeah, I looked at that analysis yesterday, and I disagree with it. Okay. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, when you compare the size, the the growth, the growth rate, which is what they're comparing to right. last year, well. Until March, there was no growth in the Fed balance sheet. So, of course, it's going to look much, much bigger. And the other is that they're looking at the money supply, and the money supply is not connected to the size of the balance sheet at all. The Fed isn't printing money. What they're doing is giving people reserves, which never leave the system. It's a little complicated, but basically it only becomes money if banks start lending it out. And if banks start lending it out, there is an economic return to it. So it's not really that. But on the other hand, uh, we don't need $120 billion a month in Fed bond buying. It's not uh, – the, the interest rates aren't going to go up. As a matter of fact, interest rates have gone down over the last 24 hours, right. even though the Fed says they're going to taper. So uh, it's it's kind of uh, – Is that the market acknowledging that we really don't need it? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, the whole minute story was dog bites man. I mean, it didn't tell the market anything it didn't already know. So was it, it an overreaction? Um well, I'm not even sure it's a reaction. I mean, you look at, and, and mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll bring Dave in on this because he's the expert, but you look at volumes in August, and um, there's hardly it's anybody low. trading out yeah. there. And so things get exaggerated, and I don't, I don't think mm -hmm. that people all of a sudden decided things are going to be terrible and we should sell equities because the Fed is going to taper by the end of the year, which they told us some time ago. Well, just taking a look at, uh, since you mentioned it, Mike, the amount of trading going on, uh, when you look today, it's actually a bit busier than it was, say, last week at this time. Is that because of options, the expiration tomorrow? Well, that may well be part of it, sure. I mean, through uh, 2 o'clock Wall Street time, you had about 6.7 billion shares of New York Stock Exchange and uh, NASDAQ-listed companies uh, that had been uh, Recorded in terms of trading, and uh, you go back, that's up, uh, you know, a good 20, 25 percent from what it was yeah. a week ago. Though, you know, the, the general point is true. I mean, August does tend to be a low volume month for sure. I just want you to know that I'd pay for a picture of the two of you in cowboy hats and boots. <laughs> Let's but make I, it happen. We I, can make that happen. I, I can make my part happen, Dave. You, you got a cowboy hat you can bring in next week? Yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Texas. No okay. place from there. That's right. All yeah. right. All right. We're going to get you guys to do it. Dave Wilson, Mike McKee, thank you so much. Dave will be back with his chart of the day. Let's do the Bloomberg Business Week. By the day, it's one number that tells us a lot. Today's number is 20. Disney unveiling a new ride reservation system at its U.S. theme parks that lets guests pay extra to enjoy shorter lines for some of the most sought after attractions. The Genie Plus service that debuts this fall will cost $20 a day at Disneyland in California, 15 at Walt Disney World in Florida. That is on uh, top of the usual admission. So basically, you got to get a mortgage out to get a Disney. You got to have a plus on the, on the, on the end of it. <laughs> Too, just like everything that's additional exactly. these days. Let's get a check of the latest world and national news with Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. The Pentagon says the U.S. has evacuated 7,000 people since operations began in Afghanistan's Kabul airport last Saturday. In the last 24 hours, more than 2,000 have departed. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby says the priority now is to evacuate as many people as possible and keep them safe in the process. We're going to do everything that we can. Uh, to make sure that uh, we can protect our force, protect the people that we're trying to move on to the airport and protect their movement out of Kabul. Kirby says the U.S. has flown F-18 jets over Kabul airport to maintain security. President Biden is doubling down on his decision for the U.S. to pull out of Afghanistan. In an interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos, Biden admits that he expected things to get messy. The idea that somehow 
there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happened. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. Biden says American intelligence assessments did not foresee the collapse of the Afghan government in 11 days. A large police presence is around Capitol Hill as officers negotiate with a man in a black pickup in front of the Library of Congress who says he has a bomb. Capitol Hill Police Chief Tom Manger says he also appears to have a detonator in his hand. We are in communication with, uh, with the suspect, uh, but I, I don't want to talk about exactly what we're talking about because the negotiations are ongoing. Manger says they're receiving help from the FBI and the ATF. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Carol Master, along with Tim uh, Stenovic, and <laughs> we were having a little debate about economic data, data and interpretations. This is the problem we're in. I, I remember either hearing from a guest on Bloomberg, Tim, where they said, you know, it's so easy to figure out kind of what the Fed might do when it's a very clear, when the, when the economy is gangbusters right. or when it's, you know, in a disaster scenario or in a crisis or falling off a cliff. Like, we understood during the, the pandemic when everything stopped, we knew what the Fed was going to do. Right now we're in this period where we get some good data points, we don't, and uh, the Delta variant, so it's a lot of questions out it's there. It's a lot of questions, and it's the fact that analysts and investors, they hang on to every single word they hear from somebody at the Fed. Of course, Jay Powell is speaking next week in Jackson Hole. Well, and then there's, as Mike uh, McKee rightly points out, there's your leadership committee with Jay Powell, uh, Rich Clarida, you know, uh, the head of the New York Fed. These are key voices in that to really follow what they say, because that is often an indication of Fed policy. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. In the meantime, though, one of the things that constantly is on investor minds, and it, depending on the day, the tone, and the temperament, uh, determines kind of which way the markets go, is what's going on with COVID. And there are a few headlines that we've got out. Uh, one has to do with GOP Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi. He tested positive for COVID-19 despite being vaccinated, becoming at least the fourth member of Congress to recently report an infection. I know you sent us a headline just before we got going. Yeah, just before we uh, got going, uh, Senator Angus King, independent, uh, says that he tested positive for COVID and was vaccinated. He said he started to experience mild symptoms yesterday, so mm -hmm. he he got a test. It came back positive, and he's isolating. He also, like Senator Wicker, was vaccinated. Uh, so another breakthrough infection. So this is why we want to know about these data points. In the meantime, also on the Bloomberg, COVID-19 vaccines are less effective against the Delta variant, according to results in the UK from one of the largest real-world studies into the efficacy of the shot. So, uh, you know, this is something we need to know about, right, it, as we move forward. It is. As we move forward, as kids go back to school, the science, uh, the science changes because science always changes. Right. But we're learning more and more about what the Delta variant does and how effective vaccines are when it comes to the Delta variant. This is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. There's been a little bit of chop in markets today. A number of equity strategists uh, before the opening bell were expecting some dip buying. That did occur following the sell-off yesterday. But we're seeing a lot of those economically sensitive stocks trade lower. There's a bit of anxiety on the tapering of Fed stimulus. You couple that with concern about the spread of the Delta variant and then throw in worry over global supply chains. It was uh, overnight that Toyota said the worsening chip shortage is gonna force the company to suspend output for several days at nearly all its plants in Japan. The stock was down as much as 4.7% uh, in Tokyo overnight. Right now, Dow Industrial Average weaker by a half of 1%. The S&P has been fluctuating between gains and losses, down about a tenth of 1% right now. Same is true for the NASDAQ composite. Macy's bucking today's downtrend right now. The stock is rallying by more than 18%. Macy's reinstating its dividend and raising its sales guidance. U.S. antitrust officials have refiled their monopoly lawsuit against Facebook. Facebook shares right now down nearly two-tenths of 1%. We heard from NVIDIA last night after the closing bell. Second quarter results beat, and the chipmaker gave an outlook being viewed as strong. NVIDIA shares right now continue to trade higher, although off their best level of the day. And Robinhood markets warned of fading revenue from cryptocurrency-driven trading. Robinhood shares right now being very hard hit. Stock is down by more than 10%. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Doug. Thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Tim Stanovic in our interactive broker studio right here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York City. Our news desk just uh, sharing with our team uh, a story that just crossed the Bloomberg buyer, Jonathan Levin, uh, out there in Florida, saying COVID-19 patients are dying in U.S. hospitals at levels not seen since February, and the numbers could worsen as intensive care units overflow in parts of the South. You know, Tim, I think we thought we were beyond these kinds of headlines and stories when it came uh, to the virus, but obviously not. It certainly seems like six weeks ago we were beyond those, but a lot has right. changed since then with the spread of the Delta variant. For Fortunately, we have Dr. Amish Adalja, a senior scholar and infectious disease physician at the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, joining us on the phone from Pittsburgh. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Dr. Adalja, it's always great to, to speak with you. Give us your reaction to what we are seeing about hospital deaths hitting February levels, even as for months the vaccines have become available. What we have is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and for many parts of the country, the pandemic is being managed appropriately with hospitalizations not re reaching record numbers, but that's not the case for the whole country. There are approximately eight states that compromise about, comprise about 50% of our hospitalizations where there are enough high-risk people that have not been vaccinated that they are driving cases, they're driving hospitalizations, and they're driving deaths. And what's different about it this time is there's no excuse for it. These are vaccine-preventable deaths. These are things that are being self-inflicted. And I think that's the, the problem we have right now is that we've got a portion of the country that is just not receptive to the idea or to the, to the evidence of the efficacy of these vaccines, and they're paying for it. What's the data on people getting COVID or possibly being hospitalized for those that are vaccinated? The data, the data shows that if you're a fully vaccinated individual, it's extremely unlikely that you get a severe case of COVID-19, that the vaccines are holding up tremendously well when it comes to serious disease, hospitalization, and death. It doesn't mean it never occurs, but it means that it occurs very rarely. And when it does occur, it's often in those people who are immunocompromised or have other medical conditions that put them at higher risk for having a more severe uh, case post-vaccination. The solution to hospitalization problems is vaccination. The majority of people that are in a hospital right now are not vaccinated. And it's no surprise that the states with the lowest levels of vaccination are the ones where we're hearing about hospitals worried about capacity again. So you feel like, I mean, I'm just always curious, We, t you know, you guys in particular, we know, I know we follow the data points so closely. Do you feel like that we are tracking the vaccinated population really carefully so that we do understand what the risks are, um, engaging how high it is for those who've gotten vaccinated and yet, you know, are facing similarly the Delta variant like the rest of the population. 
when it comes to hospitalizations that occur among vaccinated people, there is a concerted effort to have that data available and to continually look at it and update it. And, and that's what the CDC has been focused on. So mm -hmm. I am confident that when it comes to severe disease, we have a good idea of how what proportions are occurring amongst the vaccinated. And I don't think it's something that's a major risk. And where it was identified as a risk, for example, immunocompromised patients, that's where you saw that third, the third primary dose uh, recommended a couple of weeks ago for people who, for example, had organ transplants or were on high doses of steroids. That was in direct recognition of the fact that there was clinical data showing that those people were comprising uh, a high proportion of those who were getting hospitalized post-vaccination after being infected with COVID-19. Dr. Adalja, yesterday we had uh, Dr. William Hazeltine, Chair and President of Access Health International, on the show, and he brought up some uh, disturbing news from Israel, and he, he referenced a, a study in science that says that nearly 60% of gravely ill patients in Israel are fully vaccinated. So while we certainly see different numbers here in the U.S., I'm wondering your reaction to that, how you read into that data. I think that this is something that's very complicated to explain on a, on a radio show, but there is a lot of statistical issues with the way that that data has been reported. There's actually a statistical paradox in there because Israel is such a highly vaccinated country that you're seeing kind of a paradoxical look at the data, meaning that the, high, the people that are at highest risk for getting COVID, no matter what, or getting hospitalized for COVID-19 are going to be older. The older tend to be heavily vaccinated in, in Israel. If you're younger, vaccinated or not vaccinated, you're at very low risk for getting severe disease. So when you look at the way they've reported their vaccine efficacy, it's really being skewed by the age stratification. And if you crunch all the numbers step by step, and there's a, a blog post going around where a biostitian has done that, you see that it is holding up in Israel against severe disease. It's just an artifact of the fact that it's a highly vaccinated country. And if you are older, you're, al you're, you're always going to be at risk for getting a higher getting a more severe case, more likely to be hospitalized, and it's getting kind of skewed. So I so, don't think the Israeli data shows that the, that the vaccines are eroding their protection against severe disease. In other words, if everybody in a country is vaccinated, then of course the people who are most gravely ill will be vaccinated because they are the ones who are vaccinated. Or exactly. will be gravely ill, will have been vaccinated. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. So that doesn't concern you. No, it doesn't concern me because uh, when you look at the data, it, it actually supports the fact that, that the vaccines are still working in Israel at preventing grave, uh, grave illness. It's just that there's so many people vaccinated that the numbers, when you, when you talk about sheer per percentages, it's going to mm -hmm. look that way. It's just like breakthrough infections are going to get more common as more people in the country are vaccinated. Breakthrough infections are going to have a bigger, they're going to be a bigger proportion of cases because right. there's more vaccinated people. Hey, sit tight for a second. We're going to come back with Dr. Amish Adalja, infectious disease physician, senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. I just want to say thanks to our audience who are sending us uh, emails, tweets, and stuff uh, for questions to ask Dr. Adalja. A lot of questions. Uh, one specifically around messaging. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the what the administration is doing right now isn't necessarily working to the fullest extent that it could, given right. that vaccine vaccinations are still not growing. Uh, so what could the administration be doing better? Right, exactly. Although, as President Biden said, thank you, private sector, for doing yeah. your part, right, which point. increasingly is. All right, let's get back to your top business headlines. Another check on the trading day. Here is, once again, Doug Krisner. Hey, Carol. Uh, we've seen uh, the equity market kind of move lower. Now, a lot of concern about what options expiration may mean tomorrow. That's when the August contracts expire. So we're seeing a little bit of volatility. The VIX right now is above 23 and we're also seeing a lot of weakness in the economically sensitive stock groups, particularly crude oil. More on that momentarily. But there is related to the concern over the economy, this issue of the spreading Delta variant. Patients are now dying in U.S. hospitals at levels not seen since February. And the numbers could worsen at ICUs over the portion of the U.S. Right now, Dow Industrial Average down about 7 tenths of 1 percent. The S&P 500 weaker by about 4 tenths of 1 percent. And the Nasdaq Comp uh, down about 3 tenths of 1 percent. I mentioned weakness in the energy complex. Right now, the S&P 500 Energy Group is down nearly 4 percent. Crude oil in New York is trading off about 2.8 percent right now, 63.60. Overnight, we learned that refinery output in China actually decelerated a bit. On the positive side, NVIDIA's numbers last night after the bell, sending those shares higher. Second quarter results were above forecast, and the chipmaker also gave an outlook viewed as strong. Robinhood markets warned of fading revenue last night after the closing bell, uh, this largely due to a, a drop in cryptocurrency-driven trading. And Robinhood shares right now being very hard hit. Stock is down by more than 10 percent. Also look at what's happening with those Chinese ADRs here in the U.S. Last night in Beijing, or I should say Beijing time, uh, we got word that the government is studying proposals to further ensure the rights of drivers who work for online companies. Another round of a new regulation, potentially. Today, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon China Index is down by more than 5%. Tim, Carol, to you. Okay. Doug, really appreciate it. Doug Krisner, be sure to uh, always catch Doug on Daybreak Asia uh, on Bloomberg Radio, live from Hong Kong and New York at 6 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Radio. Let's get back to our guests. Dr. Amish Adalja, senior scholar and infectious disease physicians at the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Joining us on the phone from Pittsburgh, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Dr. Adalja, we started our conversation in the last block by you saying that this is a pandemic in the United States of the unvaccinated. We got a, a question from one of our listeners who says that given we are unable to reach or have been unable to reach many of the people who are hesitant to get the vaccine with the messaging that we've seen right now, what is the way to break through to them, to convince them to get the vaccine? People have to see the vaccine as an individual benefit to their life, something that's going to make their life better, just like any other product that they might take. And I think for a while, the CDC undersold the vaccine, and then they and then they changed guidance, and that drove that drove people to get vaccinated because they didn't need to wear a mask. And, and then they changed guidance back, and I think that's making it a little bit more difficult for for people to to see this as an individual benefit. But I think what we have to do is show people that this is the way to remove the threat of COVID-19 from their lives. And it's going to be hard for people who maybe are at low risk for hospitalization. And we have seen some people in those states that where they're getting hit hard get vaccinated now, and that's that's encouraging. But I think it's more going to be kind of nudging that's going to help now. And one thing that could happen is the FDA giving full approval of these vaccines. That's going to take away one of the talking points from the anti-vax crowd that says that these are they, they kind of claim that this is an experimental vaccine, which it is not. That's one thing we can do is get the FDA to give full approval. And then I think having more private organizations think about COVID-19 vaccination as a way to improve their workplace safety and to improve their resilience to the pandemic in terms of their workforce. So they have less people getting sick, less people having to do contact tracing, be isolated, be quarantined. That's one way I think that we 
we're going to start to see vaccinations go up. But there's going to be a proportion of the population is just not going to move on this issue. And, and I think we're going to have to increasingly come to accept that and maybe make very marginal marginal inroads by kind of meeting people where they are and getting this vaccine into doctor's offices where people can talk to their primary care physician whom they trust. That's also uh, something I think that needs to be done as well. Instead of having to go to a drugstore or a mass vaccination center or a health department, having your PCP sit down and say, this is why I want you to get this vaccine. I think that would go a long way. Um, I'm always curious. We talk to a lot of members of the Johns Hopkins community, and we're really grateful for it. Um, and we get really great perspective, a lot of in-depth information. What kind of debate, though, internally goes on when it comes to COVID, the vaccine? Because we, to be fair, um, Dr. Adalja, like, there are some, it feels like members of your community, they're a lot more conservative in their view about vaccines or going out or wearing masks. And others, I think like yourself, who are like, you can be out there um, in a safe way if you're vaccinated and so on. So I'm just curious about the conversations you guys have uh, back in uh, Johns Hopkins. So, so I think there's definitely varied opinions. And I think it all has to deal with risk tolerance and risk preferences. And some people are more risk tolerant than others. Some people also the way they communicate to the general public is more of an abstinence only approach and others are more harm reduction. And I do think it, it has split the field a lot, but I think what, what I know is that from sexually transmitted infections, from HIV, that giving people tools to be able to do things that they wanna do safely or safer knowing that you can't get the risk down to zero, I think is a much better way than to tell people never to do something or that this is absolutely forbidden to do and nothing changes. Because remember, this is an endemic respiratory virus. This isn't a temporary state of affairs. This virus is gonna be with us 10 years from now. And if we don't teach people how to risk calculate, we're really hampering their ability to actually pursue those things that they love, their values. And I think that's the part where, where I, some of some colleagues of mine, I, I vehemently disagree with because I think that they somehow think that this magically is going to disappear. It's not. And I think that's why we have to, that's why I've always been someone that's tried to help people think about what to do and how to do it safer, knowing that there's some level of risk and, and that risk might be worth taking depending upon what, what the value is that you're pursuing. And I think a lot of that was missing uh, in, the, in this pandemic. And I think we're, we're all harmed by it because mm -hmm. people then took risks that were, were too dangerous because they didn't have any, any, toolkit to, to rely on to help them decrease risks. Uh, Dr. Adalja, just in the last 30 seconds that we have with you, you said it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Unfortunately, there are tens of millions of kids under the age of 12 who are unvaccinated because the vaccine is not available for them. What is the best way for parents and them uh, to judge risk as school starts again, just in 30 seconds? First of all, surround your child with as many vaccinated people as possible. That's the best way to keep them safe. The other is, this is going to depend upon parental risk tolerance. Is your child somebody that has risk factors for severe disease like asthma or they had an organ transplant or they've got cancer? Then you need to be very, very cautious. If, it's a, if you're dealing with a healthy child, remember that other viruses like flu, like RSV, pose a bigger threat to your child than COVID-19 does. So your child is likely to be spared the severe consequences. But right. I think it's important if you're in an area where there's high transmission to take, to take precautions like wearing a mask at school. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Amish Adalja over at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, of course, at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, supported by Michael R. Bloomberg. Well, let's get a check of the latest world and national news with Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. The U.S. is sticking to the August 31st deadline for the military to be completely out of Afghanistan. And today, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby was pressed on reports about Americans being unable to reach the Kabul airport. There has been no decision to change the deadline and we are focused on doing everything we can inside that deadline to move as many people out as possible. Kirby says more than 5,000 U.S. troops are now involved in airport evacuation efforts. The messy departure of U.S. troops and Afghan allies from Kabul could impact the success of the Biden agenda here at home. Lawmakers are set to return to Washington next week, and Bloomberg Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern says Afghanistan could impact progress on other issues. There is this darkening cloud. This was supposed to be a almost honeymoon August for the president, right? He just secured this bipartisan infrastructure agreement in the Senate. And now there's going to be hearings in Congress about the administration's approach on the evacuation of Afghanistan. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. President Biden admitted in an interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos that he knew the withdrawal from Afghanistan would be chaotic, but he doubled down on that decision to leave, saying it was either exit or put more Americans' lives at risk.
Authorities in Washington, D.C. say a man has surrendered peacefully who had threatened to blow up his pickup that he parked in front of the Library of Congress not far from the U.S. Capitol. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nance, thank you so much. So, Tim, the ranks of 401k and IRA millionaires, they're exploding. They are. Perhaps not too surprising given no. that just earlier this week, Carol, the S&P 500 hit 100% increase since the March 2020 lows. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, a story like this among the most read on the Bloomberg Terminal by our own Suzanne Woolley, uh, the number of 401k accounts with balances of at least $1 million or more at Fidelity Investments, it grew 84% year over year to 412000 well, the number of seven-figure IRAs jumped more than 64,000 to 341,000, 64%, excuse me, to 341,600 in the first 12 months that ended in the second quarter. All right, so together the number of accounts with a million dollars or more growing almost 75%, though it isn't clear how many individuals that re represents because, you know, people can have multiple accounts. Um, and we should point out that the average 401k held $129,300 at the end of the second quarter of 2021. That's up 24% from a year ago. Average IRA was 139000 21% gain compared to a year ago. Come on, we know what's going on. As you said, the S&P 500 has doubled uh, since hitting a low. It did pull back, and so there were some extreme losses, but we have had a tremendous rally. Well, and here's the thing about these types of accounts. Oftentimes, I'm not going to say always, because people do trade in these accounts sometimes, and they right. can. But oftentimes, people set it and forget it. Right. And they continue to contribute to them. They get toward the end of their career. And Paul Sweeney talked about this on the show the other day. He started contributing to his in the 1980s. Right. Right. That's so he owns an island in the Caribbean. And we're going to go visit, He's got Paul. a yacht out in uh, Capri. I I'm, mean, I'm coming for you, Paul. Come on, Paul. We're, we know. We know. But, we it's, know. It's, but it's, it's true. I mean, that's, 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 and that's what's happened over the last 30 years. Meantime, though, we know the disparities. We talk about this all the time. People who are in the financial markets, in the stock market, they certainly have built a lot of wealth. But uh, some other data that's out there shows that some two-thirds of Hispanic families and about half of black families don't have a retirement plan uh, out there. And so, and among white families, about 25% don't have a retirement plan retirement plan. So we know, we talk about these gaps all the time. Yeah, and that's what's important to keep in mind when we do talk about the markets and think about who is invested and what types of people are invested in the market. This is Bloomberg Business Week, and this is Bloomberg Radio.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. We have about an hour and 12 minutes to go in today's session. A little bit of weakness in the equity space right now. A lot of the economically sensitive stocks are trading lower. Fair amount of anxiety on uh, the Delta variant. Patients are dying in U.S. hospitals at levels not seen since February. These numbers could worsen at ICUs. Uh, they're overflowing in parts of the South, and we're just getting word now from the Bloomberg Terminal. IBM is temporarily closing its uh, New York City offices against, or amid, I should say, rising cases. Right now, Dow Industrial Average weaker by a half of 1%. The S&P down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Similar decline for the NASDAQ comp. On the positive side, though, we're seeing a rally in shares of Macy's. The stock is up more than 19%. Macy's reinstating its dividend and raising its sales guidance. NVIDIA reported uh, second quarter results last night after the bell above expectations. The chipmaker also gave a very strong outlook, or an outlook, I guess you could say, that was viewed as strong. Shares are up by more than 3%. While we're talking chips tonight, after the closing bell, we'll hear from Applied Materials. Continued concern about regulatory risk in China. We know many of the big consumer-facing tech firms there are facing an onslaught of new regulations. The latest? Well, Beijing is studying proposals to ensure the rights of drivers who work for online companies. Right now, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon China Index is down by more than 5%. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Doug, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovic. In the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week, uh, on newsstands online at businessweek.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal, our Business Week team really spreading out, talking to people, Tim, around the world about soaring food prices, how they are coping, and the sacrifices that they are making. Yeah, it shares a story of uh, people in Nigeria, in India, in Brazil, and in more places, and about the global implications of soaring food costs. Joining us now is Joel Weber. Editor at Bloomberg Business Week. He's joining us on the remote from Massachusetts. Also, Ann Riley Moffitt, Senior Editor for Energy and Commodities for Bloomberg News. She's on the phone from Rhinebeck, New York. Joel, what I this is a heartbreaking story. It, you know, there the, the part that really got to me were the instances of, of kids who can no longer share a glass of milk before mm -hmm. they go to bed because their parents can't afford it. Um, but what it also does is it shows the global story of higher food prices and the way that it we talk about these things in the abstract but the way that it affects people uh, in such big ways around the world. Yeah, and, and big credit uh, to Anne on this one because she was really the, the architect that, that envisioned it and helped bring it all together. Um, the number that just really um, uh, caught my attention when I read it was that uh, there's been a 31% uh, increase in food prices from July to July, and that is just startling when you think about how many families are already kind of living hand hand to mouth, and then you know you, you think about the cost of food in that, and 30% is a s significant jump that forces a lot of families around the world to make some really hard choices. Um, and and on top of it, I I thought the policy implication that was sort of interesting is that you know central bankers around the world, food and fuel are two things that they don't bring into to bear when they're thinking about inflation. So this is sort of an invisible problem on a policy level, uh, and and that makes it um, you know I think all the all the more tragic. Um, so Anne, talk to us about um, how this project came into being. Hearing, uh, you know, since the start of the year, that food prices are up, food prices are up. But we often hear it from, you know, a trader's perspective. You know, soybeans are at the multi-year high. Or, um, but when you actually look at real families, when chicken breast in the U.S., for example, is now at a six-year high, you know, that's not just a number on a piece of paper. That's something that really impacts people's budgets. And when you want to buy that chicken breast, you're not buying something else if you're staying within your budget. And so, you know, we had this idea to really look at the actual sacrifices and swaps that families are making in real time. And so um, luckily Bloomberg News has a great staff of journalists around the world, um, and we selected one uh, reporter in each of these four countries we looked at, uh, Nigeria, India, Brazil, and the U.S., and they found a family who was willing to go grocery shopping with the reporter, you know, every week this summer or, you know, call them on their way home from the market or text them or WhatsApp them. You know, we were in communication with these families in a lot of different ways. But to say, hey, this week when you went to the store, what did you buy? 
How was it different than what you planned to buy? What thing did you not bring home that you wanted to, and then you saw the price and you had to make a real-time decision not to? And what are you going to feed your family this week? Um, and these great reporters got to know these families um, very well, and they shared a lot with them. And so I think it's a it's a really powerful package, and I think it, it, it takes these numbers that feel very abstract and makes them feel very real. And I think you're right, very sad in some circumstances. And that is so true. And I love what Joel said about, I think about it when we do inflation data, it's like back out, you know, when we do core inflation, back out the food and energy prices, it's like, wait a minute, I'm paying for food and energy. It impacts my ability to do things going forward. Uh, and this is what's great about this story. It brings it down to individuals, families, and what they are really doing. And it's not just, I think sometimes in the developed world, we think it's a developing world problem. It is, but it is also in the developed world. Right. And I, I think what's so important about this is even though we did look at several um, developing nations in those countries, we made sure to select families who are, you know, I mean, what is a representative family, but who consider themselves middle class. So Bloomberg has done a lot of great reporting on hunger and homelessness. Uh, but here we're looking at people who are employed, who often both parents in the family are employed. You know, they're bringing in incomes and still they're having a hard time um, getting that money um, to pay for food. Um, same thing in the United States. The family we talked to, um, this, this woman in South Carolina, you know, we would not call her food insecure. She actually, if you saw the picture, she has two full-size upright freezers where she stores meat, you know, until she needs it. So she's, in a lot of ways, doing really well, but it's because she spends all this money up front buys in bulk, buys by the case, which wasn't something I even knew you could do with meat, um, so that she saves money long term um, by only buying things when they're at their absolute cheapest. So, um, you know, these are not the poorest families we're looking at. These are everyday families like you and me. I'm wondering uh, about the biggest cause of food insecurity, because you, in the piece, the team around the world shares several different reasons why this is happening. It has to do with droughts and climate change. It has to do with uh, production issues because of the COVID pandemic and supply chain issues. It has to do with people having economic insecurity because of lockdowns in India, for example. What is the, the greatest driver of food insecurity, though? Gosh, that's a great question. I think one of the reasons we wanted to write this story is because it is happening everywhere and not for all the same reasons, but for a lot of the same reasons. So some of these things are kind of transitory. They're short-term problems, hopefully, around COVID, like you said, that because of, um, because of infection rates, um, you know, certain, uh, there are backlogs in meatpacking plants, or some agricultural areas can't get enough workers, or maybe the food is getting produced, but there are shortages of truckers, uh, and so we can't get the food from one place to another. I think in the last year, we really became aware of uh, you know, the challenges in the supply chain and how it does not take much very global supply chain um, you know, to mess up the flow of food. So that's a piece of it. And I think people are hopeful that that eventually fixes itself, that we get out of the pandemic and people come back to work and that is all fixed. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are also these pieces that don't seem short term and are not abating. Things like China, uh, the middle class growing so rapidly that they're importing so much more food than they ever did before. You know, meat, but also cooking oils and things like that, um, which ties up the price for everybody else. Uh, or climate change. You know, um, some of the freak things that happened this year was a, a frost in Brazil that has really decimated the the coffee crop. Um, and you could call that a one-time, you know, freak accident, or you could see it as part of a probably larger trend that we're going to keep seeing this extreme weather like that. So right. that might not be as transient as everyone thinks. It is a must read, and um, there's so much information, as you heard from Anne, so we highly recommend it. We'll make sure it gets out on Twitter. Our thanks to uh, our Bloomberg News Senior Editor for Energy and Commodities, uh, Anne Riley Moffitt, on the phone in Rhinebeck, New York, along with Bloomberg Business Week Editor, Jill Weber. I mean, this is what's really going on, Tim. It is. The story is featured in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week magazine. It's available on newsstands and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. This issue, go pick it up. It is They're all good, but this is a particularly good one. All right. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic, right here on Bloomberg.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 3 p.m. on Wall Street, an hour remaining in the Thursday session. It's been a choppy day, to say the least. A couple of factors uh, to consider, not the least of which uh, the coronavirus and the spread of the Delta variant. Patients now dying in U.S. hospitals at a level not seen in February. A short while ago, we learned that IBM is temporarily closing its offices here in New York City, given rising cases. Right now, Dow Industrial Average weaker by about two-tenths of one percent. On the other hand, the S&P 500 pushing up by about two percent. Similar gain for the NASDAQ composite. There is a lot of weakness, though, in the energy complex with the S&P 500 energy index down nearly three and a half percent. This is tracking the price of crude oil lower, WTI 64 on the money. Uh, with a loss of about two and a quarter percent. Overnight, China indicated that its uh, refinery output weakened a bit in the latest period. Now, we are seeing uh, strength in shares of NVIDIA. The company reported after the bell yesterday. Second quarter numbers were above estimates. And the chipmaker also gave an outlook viewed as strong. NVIDIA shares up by more than four percent right now. Bear in mind, after the bell tonight, we'll hear from the chipmaker or chip making equipment maker, I should say, applied materials. That may give us a little bit of insight into where we are with respect to the chip shortage. We had a rout in uh, Chinese companies listed uh, not only here in the U.S., but in Hong Kong as well. Today, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index down more than 5%. So we know the Chinese consumer facing tech firms have been facing an onslaught of new regulations. The latest? Well, Beijing is apparently studying proposals to further ensure the rights of drivers who work for online companies. Regulators are also looking at more oversight in the streaming industry. In the bond market right now, 10-year Treasury with a yield of 1.24%, uh, so we're down just a bit and a stronger dollar today. I'm Doug Krisner, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed, everybody. This is Bloomberg Business Week and earnings out today from Petco Health and Wellness. It beat on the top and bottom lines for the second quarter. Second quarter, comp sales to up 20% in the quarter, easily beating the estimate of analysts. And the company raised its fiscal year 2021 guidance. They also named a new CFO. Lots going on. Tim, the stock is up 3.5%. The, the stock is up 3.5%. And joining us now is Ron Coughlin, CEO of Petco, joining us right here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I just want to say, at this time where we're wearing masks everywhere, it is so nice to have somebody joining us in the studio, Ron. It's a treat. It is shared. It is shared. It's good to be in person. So thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about the and thanks for the update on the stock. I left my phone behind. So <laughs> $19.99 a share. Well, we have the data here at Bloomberg, and we have it right away. Uh, Ron, what worked so well for Petco Health and Wellness this last quarter? Yeah, I would tell you we're hitting on all cylinders. You cited the 20 on a one-year and a 30 on the on a two-year. If you look at our e-commerce, our e-commerce was up double digit on top of being up 100% prior quarter. Our two-year stack on e-commerce is up 150%, which is just incredible. But, you know, the real thing was there was all these theories that uh, people would shift to online c during the lockdown because they had to, and then they wouldn't come back to stores. And our stores were up 17% because people love coming to our pet care centers. Our people are great. They get groomed. They get veterinary care. They get trained there. And it was the return to the stores that was the real, real story. In addition, we also put down another um, 15 veterinary hospitals, bringing our total to 155 hospitals. And wherever we do that, we're seeing a four to five point lift on our merchandise sales. So it's a good good for us. I was members. just going to ask you, how much of, because you guys really have pivoted into health and wellness in a big way. And I know here at Bloomberg, we've done a lot of stories about how that is really a growth area for the industry. How much of that ultimately is so key 
to top and bottom line metrics? Oh, it, it's the centerpiece. If you look at our portfolio, we've shifted our portfolio to healthier products and more premium products by 10 points in the last three years. Margin's better, One too, the, on this stuff? The margin's much better in, the, in those. And I'll come to frozen fresh, because that, to me, is the embodiment mm -hmm. from a food standpoint. But one of the first decisions I made was to get rid of artificial ingredients out of all our foods. We're still the only retailer. Out of everything? Out of all, we sell no, no food, no snacks with artificial ingredients. We're still the only retailer to do that, major retailer to do that. Then we got rid of shock collars last year. So we're dedicated to pet wellness. So that helps us from a food standpoint. We're uh, a market maker on um, fresh frozen, which, you know, my guy uh, eats uh, yummy, has uh, fish and sweet potatoes. I'd have a lot less <laughs> cholesterol if I didn't. Wait, that's what I had thing. for dinner last night. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's the whole theory, though. <laughs> I know. Human grade food. And uh, we're the number one retailer for, um, for that fresh and for fresh frozen space, and we're being market makers on that. What's that's the growth example. in that particular part of the market? Uh, 50%. It's 50%. supposed to go from 1 billion to 4 billion between now and 2025. And then you get into vet care, right? And uh, we're, we're driving affordable vet care because we want more pets to get the right care. Look, it's why people are no longer called pet owners, right? They're called pet parents That's instead right. because they're treating, we are treating our pets more like kids. Hey, Ron, this is for the quarter that ended in July. What can you, at the end of July, what can you tell us right now about real-time data with what you're seeing with customer behavior as the Delta variant continues to spread? Because it's a different story on August 19th than it was on July 31st when it comes to the levels of the virus that we're seeing here in the U.S.? Sadly, that is true. On a good side from our business standpoint, there you see no impact. Foot traffic I have, is the same. I have gone and looked for correlations between COVID and COVID penetrations. And I'll give you a, a real microcosm of it. I, I asked the team yesterday to look at Florida. How is our business doing in Florida where the penetration is higher? Florida is outperforming rest of chain right now. So we're not seeing that correlation. And I will tell you, our business um, accelerated on a two-year comp um, in the sec at the end of Q2 and has continued through Q3. So it's very strong, and we're not seeing. The only t time we got impacted, quite frankly, sadly, as a New Yorker, was when New York shut down. Then we got impacted because it was pretty much a complete shutdown. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else, nowhere else have we found a correlation between our business. It shifts to more online, back to the pet care centers, but we didn't see a business uh, decline. So are you at all nervous that if New York starts to kind of roll back there, that that would be an impact on your business? If you Again. had the degree of shutdown, but I think at a 50% vax or whatever New York is now, it would be hard to imagine going back to where that was. Why, why do you think this is? Why, why do you think we're seeing fewer people travel? We're seeing, we anticipate we'll see fewer people eat out in restaurants as they have to, you know, show proof of vaccination. Why are they still shopping for their pets? Yeah. Uh, on, in person rather than just online. You know, as the reopening started, I called us, us a uh, unicorn. When people, you know, stayed at home and the family, um, the, the appreciation for family, which was one of the nice things about pandemic, is being at home with your family, spending more time. And pets were central to that. And I think they helped us from an emotional standpoint. I really believe that. But then when we had reopening, all of a sudden you're getting leashes, you're getting leads. But guess what? You're also going back into our pet care centers. And in our pet care centers, you're spending more. And quite frankly, our margin's higher because we're not shipping to you. So we're winners on both sides of, of this thing. Um, but I, I just think that um, pets were so central to um, human beings making it through this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I know, I, I don't disagree with you. What about um, in terms of finding workers? Is that a problem? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so it's absolutely a tight market. Uh, but at the same time, we've done a lot of work on our employer value proposition, if you will. So we've done a lot of work on improving our compensation and benefits. We've done a lot of work on our mission. We're the only uh, company in our space whose mission is improving lives. You think all the companies do. We're the only one who has a mission of improving lives. For, so for pet lovers who want a great work experience, we're unique. I can say that, but here's the proof of the pudding. Our applications are up 60% since the beginning of the year. Our retention is up. We've never had more groomers working for Petco than we have today. So yes, it's tight, but we feel really good about our ability to navigate. Just got 20 seconds, then we'll come back and talk some more. Are you paying more, though, for those workers because it is such a tight labor market? We've had to increase. So, But we're, I don't want to say we're, we, we have raised our wage, average wage double digit in the last year, not just to compete, but because our mantra is, as PECO does better, our employees will do better. Okay, so it's part of the corporate mission culture at this point. 
Our mission is improving the lives of pets, pet parents, and the people who work at Petco. All right, sit tight. We're going to come back and continue with Ron Coughlin. He is Chairman and CEO at Petco uh, Health and Wellness, joining us uh, on a day when they reported uh, better than forecast earnings. In the meantime, let's get a check out the latest world of national news with Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Tim. President Biden is vowing to keep U.S. troops in Afghanistan until all American citizens are out of the country. That's prompted reporters to ask the Pentagon's John Kirby what happens if they stay beyond the August 31st deadline. Specifically, what will the Taliban do? If and when there's a decision to change that, uh, then obviously that would require additional conversations uh, with the Taliban uh, as well. But I don't believe that those conversations have happened at this point. Kirby says for now they're doing all they can to move as many people out as quickly as possible. A standoff not far from the U.S. Capitol is over after several hours of negotiations. Capitol Hill Police Chief Tom Manger says a man identified as Foy Raid Roseberry threatened to blow up his pickup truck that was parked in front of the Library of Congress. He got out of the vehicle um, and uh, surrendered, and the tactical units that were close by uh, took him into custody without incident. Manger says they're still determining the man's motive. Most buildings in the Capitol complex were evacuated, but lawmakers are on recess. The Federal Trade Commission has refiled its monopoly lawsuit against Facebook, seeking to salvage the landmark case that a judge threw out back in June. The new suit contains the same rationale as the original, but includes more facts to support the government's arguments that Facebook violated antitrust laws by buying Instagram and WhatsApp in order to eliminate them as competitors. Facebook will have until October 4th to respond. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic in our Interactive Brokers studio. Ron Coughlin, who is the chairman and CEO at Petco, still with us, Petco Health and Wellness. It's been a crazy year, to say the least, year and a half. And a lot of times when we have a leader on or a CEO on, we ask about leadership lessons because we didn't have a playbook about any of this. No. I, 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 this year has been unique on two fronts. The first one is as a leader, ha having to say that the health and wellness of my employees is first and foremost. And you're making decisions real time that affect their health. Are they going to wear masks? Aren't they going to wear masks? Last week, we put vaccination trucks um, in our distribution centers to get people vaccinated. Are they going to take them up or not? And you know, it was a real moment of truth for us as a leadership team. But I will tell you, lots of people like to criticize the PE firms. Every single decision I made to spend money to take care of our people, they supported. Uh, and when you make the right decisions for your people, guess what happens? Your people are loyal to you. And so we talked earlier about yeah. our, um, you know, our ability to hire. Our retention is up, and you get a buzz, and you're the type of company that takes care of people. And it was a real lesson. I think the second thing was we've most, most of us have spent our careers avoiding um, some topics like race. Mm -hmm. And BLM, um, that was not an option. And we all had to learn how to engage in these and to put your guards down. And I remember hearing um, a director who works in my company and the merchandise team talking about how he's afraid to go in his next door neighbor's backyard if the dog walks there because his wife's afraid he's going to get shot. And you know, having those discussions in the workplace is not something you were comfortable doing, but it makes us a better community. Yeah, no doubt about it. And that is something, it's, it's very interesting this last year and a half. There are conversations we've never had with colleagues, with bosses, with leaders, with family members, with friends, and that definitely has come out in a big way. We're going to continue with Ron Coughlin. He is the chairman and CEO at Petco Health and Wellness. And as we mentioned, they came out with the earnings earlier today, stock up about 3.5%. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovec, and this is Bloomberg Radio.
trends and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's been a day of choppy trading in the equity market. We're about 42 minutes away now from the closing bell. Let's get to the Bloomberg Macro Squawk Desk to get the very latest on the price action. Bill Maloney is with us. Hey, Bill. And good afternoon, Doug. U.S. stocks trading mixed today. And like you said, in a choppy tape, Dow's currently down 44 points. S&P's higher by nine. NASDAQ climbs by 36. The U.S. 10 yield falls to 1.24%. Gold is down eight. Transports dropped 219 points. But Bitcoin is higher by 4.7%. Among the main 11 SP sectors, leaders were tech and consumer staples. Energy was under pressure. And leaders to the upside in the Dow, Cisco and UNH, while Caterpillar and Boeing led to the downside. After earnings, Macy's soared as much as 23%. And in other news, ValueX is said to build a $1.2 billion position in Fiserv. And Facebook's antitrust case was refiled by the U.S. FTC. Wrapping things up, Applied Materials reports after the bell. Live from the First Republican News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Duck. All right, Bill, thank you. And we have options expiration tomorrow, so that may be uh, accounting for a little bit of the volatility today. Ten-year Treasury right now with a yield of 1.24%. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Doug Krisner. Let's get right back to Ron Coughlin, CEO of Petco, joining us now in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Petco Health and Wellness reporting earnings earlier in the day. Second quarter comp sales uh, beat uh, estimates coming in 20% increase versus 13%, 13.7% estimates. The company is saying that it sees 2021 adjusted EPS 81 cents to 85 cents. Shares higher now by 3.16%. Uh, Ron, we were talking COVID is the backdrop to everything that's happening right now. What is your policy on masking in stores right now? Is it different also regionally depending on where you have stores? Yeah, so we made the decision uh, several weeks ago after um, having uh, letting our employees make their choice uh, that they all have to have masks on consistent with CDCs. We've been following CDC. And then um, in t when there's local regulations, then we defer to those. So with uh, our customers, if you're vaccinated, it's your choice. If you're unvaccinated, we ask you to wear a mask. Do you plan to require your employees to get vaccinated? Uh, at this point, we have not made that requirement. Why? You know, we tend to resemble the U.S., and um, it, that's a person's personal medical choice. Um, and we are respecting that, though we are encouraging. So we've offered um, payments, we've offered time off, we've brought vaccination trucks to sites, um, but at the, end of, at, at the end of the day, it is a person's personal choice. And there's also people who have medical reasons why they can't do it. Do you ask them for, do, they, do you ask your employees if they've been vaccinated and can they do other things if they have been vaccinated? Um, we ask them to submit when they get vaccinated, but uh -huh. we have not asked them um, if they are vaccinated. I, I do wonder, because the, the private sector certainly has a role in this, as we yeah. heard from President Biden, as we heard from the way that Americans trust their their, their employers yes. uh, in, in different ways than they trust health officials, than they trust mm -hmm. the government. If and when the CDC does fully authorize uh, these vaccines, would you change yeah. your stance and require them? Yeah, so we're going to require for our support center uh, teams, um, absolutely. We've already signaled that, so those are our headquarter teams. Um, you know, I don't see this major um, trigger on um, the, the, the uh, FDA fully authorizing. We, we've been advised through this process by UCSD's head of epidemiology, Ch Dr. Chip Schooley. He's been fantastic. Um, and his contention is they're already authorized emergency usage. There's a lot of other th boxes they need to tick. So I don't see that as a major trigger. Um, but right now, we're not requiring vaccines for folks who work in our distribution centers or in our, um, or in our stores. How has COVID and just this whole process of the last year and a half kind of changed how you think about the company, how you think about the future, how you think about risks? 
Yeah, well, let me start on the back end uh, in terms of risk. Um, one of the things we've done is we've really focused on generating recurring revenue. We want sticky recurring revenue. So we have an offer called Repeat Delivery where um, the food will show up automatically on your doorstep. We have an offer, we have insurance offers, we have a pup box, we have a brand new puppy, you get a box of great things, toys and treats for your puppy. But we launched a program called Vital Care, which is a, a, um, a brings our whole ecosystem together and so you get your checkups, you get your grooming, you get uh, discounts on products for $19 a month. So what we're trying to do is shift more of our revenue to recurring revenue. Uh, and we our rev recurring revenue customer base was up 50% this quarter, and our revenue from those customers up 60%. So we're successful. And our e-commerce is already 50% plus recurring revenue. How much, how many, all right, what percentage of your customers are involved in recurring revenue programs? Yeah, it, it, it would be, um, from an e-commerce standpoint, it's over 50%, okay. and then in total business, uh, over 10% of okay. our customers. But growing. But growing, growing 60%, or like, growing 50%, the customer yeah. base. What is the relationship between the people who order purely online and then experience at Petco Health and Wellness Center as you increasingly make these experiential yeah. locations, and, and how do you grow that? How, what are the synergies there? I think I honestly believe this is the future of retailing. The hybrid. The hybrid. The, we we call it omni-channel. Omni-channel has been thrown around for years, but I think the pandemic. I finally understand really what it means yeah. now that I'm using it more. The pandemic <laughs> really brought omni-channel to life. Totally. Thirty-nine percent of customers say that's how they want to purchase, which is why our model well, is so powerful because we have the stores and we have the e-commerce. I mean, you can't groom your pet, you know, through e-commerce yet, so. Yeah. It makes sense that there are physical locations and this omnichannel approach works. That's right. And you also can't get advice on what's the best food. 90% of mm -hmm. pet parents want to do the right thing for their, the best thing for their pet. Only 50% know what it is, but, what but that looks like. You must be exploring a way for people to ask those questions of experts uh, in, in an e through an e-commerce channel, the same way that they can ask those questions from an associate in one of your stores. Yeah, we have an asset called Pet Coach, and yeah. it's there. Um, but there's nothing like It's amazing how influential... Um, our, our folks in our stores are. I, we were talking, you know, lots of questions on supply chain, right? Because right. there's not one vendor who thought we're, there's going to be 10 million pets last year, right? So nobody That's was crazy. scaled up to provide this. But when you come into our pet care center, oh, I'm sorry I don't have Royal Canaan, but I have that same urinary tract product for um, Hills. Can I, can I get you that product? And our folks are trusted. Uh, and so they have a real... Roll. Sorry, no, no, I didn't yeah, mean to yeah. cut you off. Just quickly, like 20 seconds, we'd be remiss. The outlook, does it feel like you can repeat what happened in the second quarter or the comparisons get a little tough? No, actually, the litmus test was how we ended Q2 and into Q3, and we feel really, really strong. Our model's working, our, our people can execute, so we feel really good about the, the guide and the raise that we, we uh, brought. Favorite forward. dog toy? Favorite dog toy. Um, there's, uh, uh, oh, hurry, uh, Ron, hurry. Uh, L Lammy, Lammy, <laughs> Lammy is dog crack. Uh, okay, Ron Coughlin, so much fun, so much information. The head of Petco. This is Bloomberg.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Okay, Carol. You say what? Hall and Oates. Okay. Oh, you're talking about music. Yeah, I'm talking about music. I was going to say, weekend. you say Lowe's, I say Home Depot. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's a little teaser. Yeah. The chart of the day. All right. I was, I'm thinking song of the day already. You did get the weekend yesterday. No, I, well, Nancy Lyons oh, got Nancy the weekend. Lyons. She Nancy, helped. I hope Thank you're listening. Thank you, Nancy, Nancy, so much. Make sure you like are ready to help us yeah. out, okay? All right, Nancy fingers Lyons. ready. Send the chat. <laughs> Let's get to Doug Krisner with the latest on the trading day as we get close to the close. You go back to one of the earlier albums, I'm thinking Abandon the Luncheonette, but I have oh, no... Nice. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's a great... All right, you got to help us out, too, Doug. Yeah, Chris, maybe. You better be listening. Maybe. Okay. All help right. me, not Tim, though. So okay. we got about 28 minutes uh, until the closing bell. We, we've really seen a choppy session today. Now, a number of strategists were saying at the opening bell, expect some dip buying after that sell-off yesterday. Complicating uh, the situation, we've got August options expiring tomorrow, so that's increased volatility just a bit. And then on top of that, a great deal of concern over the spread of the Delta variant. Patients now dying in U.S. hospitals at level Levels not seen since February, and IBM now temporarily closing offices here in New York City given rising cases. Even so, the company did stop short of delaying plans to reopen other U.S. locations by September. Right now, we have the Dow up about a tenth of one percent, S&P 500 better by about four tenths of one percent, NASDAQ composite better by about three tenths of one percent. U.S. antitrust officials have refiled their monopoly lawsuit against Facebook. The stop has been fluctuating a bit right now higher, interestingly, by about two-tenths of one percent. NVIDIA with numbers after the bell yesterday that were above forecast. And the chipmaker also gave an outlook uh, for the future that was viewed as very strong. NVIDIA share is better by more than four percent now. And pay attention to what happens after the bell with applied materials if you're looking for any visibility into the global chip shortage. In terms of the bond market right now, we've got a 10-year Treasury yielding 1.24%. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Doug Krisner. This is Bloomberg. I know, Mama, I'm coming home. Who is Mama, this? I'm coming home. Absolutely. I knew the song title. Wow. Okay. I heard it. It's not Stenevec, that hard. you are hot. Well, I got I, I was listening. You got to okay? get the artist, though. I don't know. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Give, us a, uh, give us a decade. I'm going to cheat. Now. Give you a decade. I mean, he's been around since the 70s. Ozzy Osbourne. Yes. Oh. I did cheat. Wow. So well, I Googled. So is that considered cheating or just Googling? That's, that's definitely that's cheating. That's you, Carol. Okay. <laughs> that's you. Oh, we know how you tackle slam. these, oh, you know, geez. song of the day. A little oh. chilly in here, Yeah, but you're not, you know, averse <laughs> to using Google to help you out. That's no, all I'm saying. It's that's a all I'm saying. It's it also a helps us learn. It's a tool in my toolkit. Why not? All right. Absolutely. I love when Ozzy Osbourne, though, is mellow. Yeah. Like it throws me. Okay, go ahead. Chart of the well, day. Well, there you go. All right, like I said, had to be about home mm -hmm. in some form because, you know, in the last couple of days, we've heard from the two biggest U.S. home improvement retailers. Uh, we had the numbers out of Home Depot on Tuesday. They did not go over well. We had the numbers out of Lowe's yesterday. That did go over very well. And as a result of the different response, you've seen a valuation gap close that has really been opening up for the better part of two decades between Lowe's and Home Depot. You know, you go back a couple weeks, I mean, the uh, forward price earnings ratio, so looking ahead 12 months and using projected profit uh, to compare with share prices, you had a forward PE on Lowe's that was more than six points lower than the one on Home Depot. And you had not seen that kind of a gap in almost 20 years. You had to go all the way back 
to August 2001. Hmm. So it's like the valuation in relative terms of lows peaked early 2000s, and it's pretty much been coming down ever since, as the chart shows. Besides, I got to give props to Dan Curtis uh, over on the market's desk in Bloomberg Television, because uh, he was the one who originally was kind of playing around with this comparison. I just took it back to try and get some historical perspective. And there you go. I mean, as of yesterday, it got to four and a half points, which is still a lot in relative terms, but not nearly as much as we saw just a couple of weeks ago. Um, put that all together, and you've got a chart. If you want to see it, folks, send me an email. I'll get it to you with the explanation that goes with it and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. It was really interesting what we saw with earnings from these two companies this week, this week, Dave, because we saw Lowe's actually fall more than Home Depot after Home Depot reported results and in sympathy. And then Lowe's came out with results and it really surprised investors to the upside. Yeah, absolutely. And one distinction you can make between those two companies is just profitability. That Lowe's gross profit margin, basically after merchandise costs and that sort of thing, uh, was pretty much in line with analysts' average estimate in the Bloomberg survey. Home Depot, on the other hand, came up short by half a percentage point. People didn't like that. And there's been so much focus on profitability because we've gotten used to the idea that companies are beating earnings and sales estimates. They've done it so regularly for the second quarter that, to some extent, you look elsewhere to try and find, you know, any signs of weakness. And, and margins have been one of them, especially this week with the retailers. Just uh, FYI, Lowe's is up 26% so far this year. Home Depot, a gain of 22% if we're looking at the YTD. Uh, stock of the day, what do you got? Okay, I've got two simple holdings. This is TU, capital S, simple. It's a company that's developing a network for autonomous trucks. So, you know, building out the technology. Uh, What's that the ticker again? TSP. Oh, TSP. TSP, got it. Thank Thanks, you. Tim. Sorry, Thank Dave. You. Spared me the trouble. I was getting to that in any case. <laughs> I look out for Carol. This is a company <laughs> that Kathy Wood's ARK Investment bought uh, into when it went public, you know, just a few months ago. Yeah. And she's been... About six, six and a half million dollars, six and a half million shares almost, at least according to... Uh, it's actually up from there. Is that it? Okay. figure was as of the end of June. Okay. She's now at about 8.9 million. Wow. You know, which is a 4.8% stake up from 3.5%. <laughs> you know... Daily numbers come out of uh, ARK Investments Funds. She was adding shares every day last week, took a day off, it would appear, on Monday. But yesterday, bought another 200,000 shares. So she's getting really close to that sort of 5% threshold that people pay a lot of attention to. And in response to that, Too Simple at one point was up more than 19.5% in today's trading. It's given some of that back. Still higher, though, by 8.1%. We're going to actually catch up with her pretty soon, so maybe we'll ask her about that purchase and uh, what she likes. All right, Dave yep. Wilson, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Let's get a check of the latest world and national news with Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. A man who claimed to have a bomb in his pickup truck near the U.S. Capitol has surrendered to law enforcement, ending a standoff that lasted for hours and forced the evacuation of most buildings near the Capitol. Capitol Hill Police Chief Tom Manger identified the man as 49-year-old Floyd Ray Roseberry of North Carolina. We don't know if there are any explosives in the vehicle. It's still an active scene. Uh, while uh, Mr. Rosenberry has been taken into custody and has been removed from the scene, uh, we still uh, have to uh, search the vehicle and render the vehicle safe. Major says it is believed the man was acting alone. The Pentagon says there have been no security incidents at Kabul Airport, but evacuations are still below the levels they'd like to see. Press Secretary John Kirby was asked about the likelihood that the August 31st deadline to complete the evacuations will have to be extended. There has been no decision to change the deadline. And if and when there's a decision, obviously a certain measure of agreement with the Taliban on what we're trying to accomplish has to continue to occur. General Hank Taylor said U.S. fighter jets have been making reconnaissance flights over Kabul, but not at low altitude as a show of force. In Washington, or Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. The world is waiting to see if the Taliban have changed their ways. President Biden says he does not believe they have. I think they're going through a sort of an existential crisis about do they want to be recognized by the international community as being a legitimate government? I'm not sure they do. 
President Biden speaking with ABC News, George Stephanopoulos. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, stop whatever you're doing. Okay, I'm stopping. Because... Say it isn't so, but American Airlines says it will not serve alcohol <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with that. in the main cabin of its flights until January 18, 2022, when the U.S. mask mandate on public transportation is now set to expire. This, there's a reason that this is happening, though. Yeah. Uh, so the company is saying uh, in a memo to employees, according to CNN, we are doing all we can to help create a safe environment for our crew and customers on board our aircraft. Uh, the company, you might recall, um, in its main class of service, right? So in its main cabin, that's not first class, not business class. The masses, basically. Yeah, it's where I sit, Sorry. Carol. It's where I sit, okay? <laughs> this is the part of the plane that I sit in. It's not the part when you're like loading and you're trying to jam your bags in and you walk past business and first class where they're already having a cocktail. Sometimes I accidentally, my backpack just Oops. hits a little bit. Sorry. No, that's just, I'm just kidding because I have to gate check it because I get on so late that there's no room in the overhead bins for Don't me. Don't you hate that? Dude? Yeah. Anyway, so, but go ahead. No, go finish what you're saying. Like, well, I mean, to, to, to keep employees safe, to keep customers safe, uh, because of the mask mandate, part of it. And the other part, too, I think, is that we have to talk about with this case is what we've seen in the incidences in the sky and the relationship between alcohol being served and those incidents. We've all seen them. They go viral when people film them. It gets messy. I talked to uh, a senior executive uh, in the airline industry who said a lot of people who've been pent up at home during the pandemic feel like they have a right to now be back on planes and that it gets really messy and really problematic for the stewards who are serving all of these passengers and a lot of it has to do with the alcohol flowing. And so uh, the flight attendants need some way of kind of keeping order up in the sky. Well, let's talk about keeping order because uh, the, uh, the chaos in the sky has prompted a record FAA enforcement and the largest wave of enforcement cases since the epidemic <laughs> of unruly airline passengers began this year. U.S. regulators hit 34 people with civil charges that could total, Carol, more than $531,000 in fines. Cases include passengers who made death threats and physically assaulted flight attendants and fellow flyers. According to the FAA, they put out a news release today. Many in Involved people who refused to wear mandatory face masks and were drinking alcohol illegally. Yeah. All right, well, there it so is. that exactly that's what's going on. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. We're going to count you down to the close.
news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. August options contracts will expire tomorrow, and that's created a bit of volatility in uh, equities today. It's been a very choppy session all around. Many of the economically sensitive uh, stocks are on the back foot a bit. A lot of concern about the spread of the Delta variant. And now we are learning that patients at U.S. hospitals are dying at levels not seen since February. And while we're on the topic, IBM is temporarily closing its offices here in New York City given rising cases. Although the company did stop short of delaying plans to reopen other U.S. locations by September. The Dow is down about a little more than two-tenths of one percent right now. On the other hand, the S&P 500 better by about a tenth of one percent. Similar gain for the Nasdaq composite. We do have about 12 minutes until the closing bell. Persistent weakness in the energy space. Overnight, we learned that China's refinery output weakened a bit. WTI right now in the electronic session is weaker by more than 2%. We're trading around $64 a barrel. NVIDIA after the bell yesterday reported second quarter results above expectations. The chipmaker also gave an outlook that is being viewed as strong tonight after the bell. Applied materials will uh, give results and that may give a little clarity on where things stand with respect to the chip shortage. NVIDIA shares right now up by more than uh, 4%. And we've been talking about uh, Facebook today. U.S. antitrust officials refiling their monopoly lawsuit against the company. Facebook shares right now pushing up ever so slightly. I'm Doug Krisner and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm driving in my car I turn on the radio How about you let me drive? Oh no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I wanna drive. Just drive, baby. Just drive. This is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed. Just about ten and a half minutes left in the Thursday trading session. We've been bouncing around now just a hair higher, as uh, Doug mentioned, on the S&P 500, down on the Dow, and the NASDAQ call it little change, just up about 15 points. Let's get to the drive to the close. Joining us now is Katerina Simonetti, Senior Vice President and Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management. Joining us now on the phone from Philadelphia. Katerina, it's great to have you on the show. What what goes through your head when you see a day like this when you know you wake up and you see what futures are doing and you think that it's going to be another day of uh, a sea of red and then lo and behold the dip buyers emerge they come in the S&P 500 higher by more than one tenth of one percent right now the Nasdaq in the green though the Dow lower. Tim thank you for having me on the show and it is very clear that market is struggling to separate noise from data and what we're seeing here is investors who on one side are getting seriously worried about the continuity of this growth when they look at the value of their portfolios and the growth that was achieved over the last year it is very clear to them that this is the type of returns that usually we realize over the course of two three years and here you know this happened in this really short period of time so the type, this type of corrections, like we saw this week, is very much, you know, something that we expect, you know, but at the same time, we also know that there are so many things that are supporting this market, like the stimulus and the fact that we're still in the low interest rate environment. Would you Every consider, see, I just want to make sure I understand that, right? You would consider yeah. the, the sell-off that we saw this week a correction? I would say that, that this is a series of small market corrections. I mean, very small. Very we're to the point where we were very, on the S&P 500 in early August. Well, absolutely. But if you saw it at some level, I mean, we were, the dip was like as low as, as much as 5%. You know, and again, we, it's not, it's something that we saw already. And when we consider the higher labor costs and the supply chain interruptions and the fact that the earnings well, that we are seeing coming in the second quarter are extremely mixed. You know, so this points to us that we're going through this mid-cycle transition. So this type of buying on dips that we're seeing right now, you know, is very typical in the fact that we are still in the bull market, but in the mid-cycle transition phase of it, you know, which is known for heightened market volatility in this type of small rolling corrections, you know, it's like something that is very typical. 
people for this stage. I don't know. Call me, I don't know. Like, I'm looking even at the VIX. I know we, uh, there's been some talk about, you know, heightened volatility. We are seeing kind of a bouncing around in the trade, but it does seem to be rather slim and thin in terms of high to low moves. And the VIX, yep, we're up above 21, almost 22, but on a historical basis, we're still pretty low. Uh, Carol, I would agree with you, you know, and again, we are seeing what is happening in the market right now in the context of the overall bull market, but you can't disregard the fact that the growth that was achieved over the course of last year in a very short time frame, right, was is extremely right. substantial, and it's justifiably so, you know, but we have to ask ourselves, like, what is next, right? And we think that the, the repositioning portfolio based on this day-to-day -day value, you know, is not not something that investors should be doing right now. What we are advocating is, you know, rotating out of the indexes, you know, taking some profits in S&P 500, in Russell 2000, and instead going with the high quality individual positions when we can pay really close attention to valuations, make sure that we know that there is appropriate market positioning, you know, the, and, and that there is future for earnings growth potential. So right? you're saying don't buy, don't buy the market, buy individual names. Absolutely. That's our position right now. Buy individual names and be very selective in security selection and also very selective in sector rotation in what type of sectors you're buying. How do you think the concerns about the Delta variant are manifesting themselves in the equity markets right now? Because we have some serious concerns. Uh, we have an article in the Bloomberg this afternoon uh, that Americans are dying in hospitals at levels uh, last seen earlier this year when the vaccine was not wide, widespread, when it was not available uh, like it is now. Apple closing a store in South Carolina, IBM closing offices in, in New York due to COVID concerns. Tim, uh, Delta is a serious concern, not only for us, but globally. Um, the way that we see that the major difference between now and when we first you know, we're introduced to this virus is the fact that we, in fact, have the vaccine. So the question here is how is Delta variant actually affecting vaccinated people and whether it makes sense to, you know, to get those booster shots and how effective they would be. You know, so I think the challenge here is to making sure that more and more, you know, a larger percentage of our population is vaccinated. But because of that, we see the long-term effect on the market to, to be not as deep as what we we saw last year specifically because we have the vaccine. We have a number of different ones that pro are proven to be quite effective. Um, and we have treatment plans that, you know, seem to work really well. But it's very much, you know, a big area of concern. As you say, don't buy the market. Uh, be much more specific in terms of your investment um, uh, choices. How much, Katerina, can you drill down for us further for our audience about what people should be buying or investing new money in right now? So oh, absolutely. The sector specifically that we like are healthcare. And Tim, to your point about Delta variant, healthcare is a sweetheart of a sector from the overall positioning because of all the pent-up demand of healthcare procedures that people did not, you know, do during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And because of this long-term positioning, because the virus is still with us, you know, evident by the Delta variant. And so healthcare is well positioned. We followed very shortly by financials. We we are in the very low interest rate environment, but we also understand by number of statements made by Federal Reserve that eventually rates are going higher and financials are, the earnings of financials are positively correlated to higher rates. So we like financial stocks. We like just generally high quality dividend paying stocks. The same could be said about consumer staples. While consumer discretionary might not be a sector to be in, because if we were going out there and got, getting some luxury goods or maybe remodeling our home or, you know, making these one-time purchases. Now, consumer staples are here to stay, you know, while consumer discretionary is not, might be something that is going down right now, you know, this, despite of the fact that we might be, you know, maybe general population will be making less money as right, stimulus right. checks are not going out anymore, right. we'll still be spending money on certain staple items. Hey, Katarina, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on a, an actual pullback here because it has been a significant period of time, almost a year, since we've seen a, a, a large pullback in the S&P 5. And I'm, I'm wondering when you think that investors should expect the market to move lower so they can actually take advantage of potential buying opportunities. And just got about 30 seconds. 
So, Tim, we see this as very much a mid-cycle transition, which is known for volatility and known for corrections that could be as uh, as deep as 10, 15 percent. We see this happening before the year end based on mm. all the, the labor shortages and higher costs. And, you know, so we just see the negative earnings revision as the next logical step. So we would think before the year end, investors should have some cash on the sidelines to be able to buy on dips. All and right. take advantage of this mm, opportunity. Before the year ends, Carol. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the master sell-off. <laughs> I tell you. Katarina, thanks so much. Katarina Simonetti, she's Senior VP Pro and uh, Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management, joining us on the phone from Philadelphia. Just a few minutes left in today's trading session. We have been bouncing around. Little changes, although the biggest, maybe on a percentage basis right now, is down uh, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. All right, coming up next, we'll be joined by our TV team for Beyond the Bell on radio, TV, and on YouTube. Counting you down to the close. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Basta, Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs, counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's our global simulcast. Carol Master and Tim Stenovic bringing together all of our audiences here to parse what's going on uh, throughout the trading day. And it's been a topsy-turvy day, a day where, Carol, a lot of folks seem to be trying to make sense here of where the economy really is going globally. Like, it's like a chopped salad, up and down. We've definitely <laughs> seen it. I mean, you know, we talk about waiting for Goodell. We are waiting for the Fed. And we really go from data point to data point. We got some, you know, jobless claims data that reminds us that we are recovering and yet the market it really does move from data point to data point depending on whether or not they want to go up or down and we got a little bit of both of that today Taylor. We did, indeed, as you really think about some of the global growth concerns, Caroline, that are coming out, and really all the charts that I've been looking at today are, well, cyclicals versus defensive, right, and airlines relative to packaged foods, and all of those stories are telling a pretty negative picture. I know on TV, we just had Anna Hahn, of course, highlighting some of the barbell approach, really focused on some of these low vol strategies, like those utilities, like those REITs, to provide some of that defensiveness. Yes, I mean, speaking of a, a negative story, continuing to monitor the spread of the Delta variant, IBM closing offices in New York. Apple closing a store in South Carolina after more than 20 employees were exposed to COVID. The news today that Americans are dying in hospitals at levels last seen in February. Taken together, this doesn't sound good as to how the virus is affecting our economy. Yeah, yeah really nervousness being shown not only in the area of equities in the area of bonds but commodities just the tell there the fact that they've been so under pressure for days now and even soft commodities getting pushed lower I, as well you know and just to bring gina martin adams back up again i mean we're going to speak with her a little bit after this but i mean she i thought her note was really great that she had out a couple of days ago about how poorly positioned some of the market was for a potential downturn or at least a slowdown here in that economic growth picture and that might be why you're seeing so much volatility as people try to sort it out nevertheless despite all that volatility you're going to get an s p 500 that is going to close higher here on the day. About a tenth of a percent, about six points here. Similar story for the NASDAQ composite, up about 16 points or a tenth of a percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's going to finish lower here on the day, down about two tenths of a percent. The big laggard of the day, of course, remains the Russell 2000. If that, of course, is the bid uh, that you would look to here for an economic recovery and economic resurgence here, it's not really showing up here. The underperformance that we've been seeing here, it's been persistent. The Russell 2000 down 1.2 percent on the day and now closing below that 200-day move moving average at 21.32. All right, we do have a headline crossing the Bloomberg. Just want to mention Adobe to buy frame.io for $1.3 billion in cash. It's a video push for the company. So just wanted to mention uh, some more deal flow happening this year. You know, in general, guys, though, I just want to go back to the overall market. Uh, the VIX, the volatility index, up almost uh, 2% today. That's after a 20% bump to the upside yesterday. And that really plays into what we're saying, this back and forth, Caroline, when it comes to the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, certainly Applied Materials getting some numbers out of there. Let's keep an eye on some of the earnings as they break. Third quarter net sales, $6.2 billion. That's a beat for Applied Materials. Remember what a stellar day NVIDIA had, so chips still going strong. Fourth quarter adjusted earnings per share, $1.87 to $2.01. That, again, a beat. And Ross Stores is going to be an interesting, interesting tell on the consumer. Second quarter earnings per share, also a beat, Taylor. Yeah, really interesting. Of course, we'll keep our eyes on some of the individual earnings that continue to come out. In the meantime, of course, Carol wanted to bring us back to really where we close on a sector level because some of these sectors are very telling when it comes to sentiment 
really what is driving the market for our radio audience. We are looking at winners and the losers. Winners, of course, it's some of the semiconductors, right? It's software, it's hardware, equipment, it's real estate. Some of these bond yield driven equities that push higher. On the losing side, you have to say it's bond yields that are back in vogue. That means banks are some of the worst performers. Autos and uh, energy as well, you're off anywhere of about two and a half percent, really highlighting a fourth strike day, Carol, of this rotation out of some of these cyclicals. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the trade, it, we definitely are seeing uh, investors looking for different opportunities. Speaking about an opportunity, certainly if you were a bull on this name, Macy's up almost 20% in today's uh, session. Uh, we're hearing from a lot of the retailers this week. What a rally, reinstating its dividend, raising its sales guidance, as well says it's bringing in younger shoppers. Same store sales, check it out. Key retail metric, we know that up 61% for co-owned stores in the second quarter versus a 43% gain uh, predicted by analysts. This stock has been almost yeah. doubling this year. I, don't you find it surprising? What? Yeah, yeah. I, I do find it surprising. And yeah. I mean, just to interject here, I mean, we should point out that that raise the forecast, we're seeing that from other retailers right now with that raw stores that Caroline mentioned, they're actually raising their full year guidance as well as well as their uh, comp sales estimate, Carol. Well, and speaking of raising full year co uh, confidence, you guys spoke to the head of uh, Petco. We did as well. Uh, that stock was up 3.6%. They raised their full year uh, guidance. Uh, and they're really upbeat about the outlook as well. Netflix, just want to mention, because it's been on my radar, up another 4.2%. It has been on a tear up about five days in a row, uh, and so no real catalyst today. Why, but yeah, why is this? Stay at home I, trade, I, guys, right? Stay that, at home. Oh, my God, don't say that. I no, was no, really I hoping you weren't going to go there, Caroline. <laughs> I was thinking it also. <laughs> I was so thinking what? that as well. <laughs> Um, let's talk about decliners here. I got to check in on Robinhood. The company reported earnings after the bell yesterday. Generated $233 million in crypto transaction-based revenue. Investors were a little concerned uh, that the company was too reliant on payment for order flow, but that revenue from crypto, more uh, than uh, the options and equities trading combined. The seasonality, though, that word seasonality that the company mentioned, it warned of fading revenue what, from crypto. What, did it have I, anything to do with the fact that 20-plus percent of their revenue came from the Doge? Yeah, I think that's what... But, but okay. what is Doge season, Romain? Uh, Romain? I, I don't know. No, but <laughs> but it, Doge is a joke. Can you build your company around a joke? I, I, I don't. The, I, the fact I, that they had, they had the fact that they had the, the ability to do that, and <laughs> other other competitors didn't. I think was a really big yeah. boon for them for the quarter. But it does raise the question with with you if you don't know the next meme stock, you don't know when that's going to happen. You don't know when the next Dogecoin is going to be. What does that look like uh, for uh, for the future looking forward? I mean, it's pretty confusing because there's likely going to be some volatility. Yeah. Um, I know. I used or, to wake up in the morning and I would turn on the Bloomberg terminal and look through all the stocks, and I just go to TikTok and Reddit and try to see what. They're <laughs> really? Doing. Are you making this stuff up? That's what it's no. Oh, you know? I do a real good research. Do you think I just show up? I, I like that, bro, man. You don't roll over and just kind of go back to sleep? <laughs> We're also keeping an eye on shares of Ford, finishing the day down by more than 2.5%. The company halting production at its Kansas City assembly plant. It also comes uh, when we saw Toyota suspending output for several days at nearly all plants in Japan next month. That both due to the semiconductor yeah. shortage. And then Illumina, this is an interesting one, down more than 7.8%. It dropped as much as 10%, the biggest drop in 11 months. It's a DNA sequencing giant. It said it would close its deal for Grail, despite the fact uh, that the European regulators had not finished their review. The company said they could get fined as a result, but uh, hey, still up 25% year to date. Meanwhile, putting that's good context. Let's put in context what's happening across different asset classes right now because today is the story of King Dollar once again. We look at the vertical as foreign currencies at the moment on your global macro movers and Bloomberg Dollar Index up five tenths of percent. This is a haven trade. This is a, a worry about the Delta variant, a worry about global growth, U.S. growth, the U.S. consumer. We're seeing money move into the dollar. It comes out of your commodity-related FX. Canadian dollar off by 1.3 percent. Aussie dollar off by 1.2 percent. Remember, concerns about the Delta variant in Australia hitting hard. Let's do commodities, therefore, because as you have dollar higher, commodities go lower, and it tugs down on gas getting hit hard. We're seeing Brent crude off by almost two percentage points, trading at $66.88. So clearly, no matter where you look, whether it be metals, whether it be soft agriculturals as well, all of it falling on these worries about global growth. And I'm also looking at, therefore, a bit of a search for safety in bonds in Australia. Yields push lower by 5.8 bips on the 10-year. Money moving to Swiss bonds, UK bonds as well, Taylor. You certainly see that within here in the U.S. with full faith and credit. I'm just going to bring you the 30-year yield is falling now for seven straight days. The 10-year yield falling for five straight days. So we've come down from a 128 to... I'm sorry, a 136 mm. to a 124, a 199 on the 30-year, 
to a 187. So this clearly has just been a migration lower in bond yields in the last week or so. And Carol, this really, mm -hmm. I think, sort of kicks off a discussion of if bond yields are telling you that there might be lower growth, lower inflation on the horizon, is that what the equity market, some of the economists are also looking as well? It's like uh, Fed Chairman Jay Powell sent you a little memo, Taylor, right? Because, I mean, this is basically what they've been arguing, right? That if we're going to see growth slow down, we know we we're going to see dramatic increases in growth because of uh, what happened during the pandemic and the shutdown of the economy, right? But folks, we see this in the debate, Romain, that goes on. I mean, there are folks that think, okay, the growth is going to continue, inflation is going to continue, and so the Fed needs to start doing something. The Fed, at least the leadership part of the Fed, is consistently reminding us that, well, wait a minute, we've got to get some clearer data come the fall. I, I do, yeah, clearer data, but you're getting a lot of, I guess, some, somewhat real-time data here, particularly on the retail side and what mm -hmm. consumers are spending here. I mean, we talk about this sell-off that we saw here in the U.S., at least in certain parts of the market. Mm -hmm. But that really tied into the sell-off we saw in Asia overnight, the sell-off we saw in Europe. And a lot of that was tied to uh, apparel makers, luxury good maker. The idea mm -hmm. here uh, that folks just aren't going to be spending as much money, particularly if the Delta variant, as is already seems to be ravaging certain parts of this world, continues to sort of spread. Interesting that that luxury bid, though, is still coming in for companies like Farfetch. Of course, this is where you can perhaps get your deals on your luxury items. And Farfetch sees third quarter adjusted EBITDA about $10 million they're gaining off after hours with the second quarter revenue beat. This is a company all about e-commerce. Interestingly, though, of course, one of the key e-commerce players seems to be wanting to get into bricks and mortar. I mean, if American Dream Mall, which we love to discuss on this show, guys, uh, over in New Jersey is anything to say about it, bricks and mortar ain't where it at when yeah. it comes what to groceries. Look, Carol, you look like a mall person. That was <laughs> ah, I've actually, I don't like malls, no? but I grew up oh. in New Jersey, and yes, we oh, were okay. well, surrounded by malls. That's by default, right? I don't know what that says about me. Thanks, yeah. Romaine. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't. I, I love American Dream. Up in a it's got a judgment. Lego. It's got a Lego place to no go judgment. and hang out with the kids. I'm, Tim's I'm never, long Tim's, American Tim's Dream. Tim's never been in a mall. He's, <laughs> he's, a, he's an online guy. It's been a few years. I've yeah. been in. I know that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get back to you, Romain. All right, that's going to do it for I'm our cross-platform coverage on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg TV, on YouTube, and at many malls across America. <laughs> Catch us next time, uh, same time, same place tomorrow. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. You know, it is so interesting, Carol, to hear about the conversation that we had shifting around Delta. We talked to Ron Coughlin, CEO at Petco, and he said that even though the spread of the Delta variant is happening right now, foot traffic is not down, even in places like Florida that have been its hit so hard. I do find it interesting, but I do wonder if the numbers continue to go up, if we start to see more shutdowns, yeah. whether or not that will persist, and we'll, I guess time will tell. Why are you not a mall person, and I am? Uh, I'll, I'll hang out in the mall. All Especially right. that huge one in New Jersey. I want to go there. <laughs> no, you won't. Nobody's going. I know. That's the problem. <laughs> it's problems. skiing. I want to try that. <laughs> All right. You have a good night. Let's get over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. for World of National News. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. The State Department is flying in more consular officers to clear American allies and eligible Afghans for takeoff to safe havens. But there remains a problem getting them safely to the Kabul airport. Department spokesman Ned Price addressed the barriers to entering the airport, despite which 6,000 people are now there awaiting flights. Every report of someone unable, for whatever reason, to reach the airport, we take very seriously. We are making very clear together with our international partners that safe passage should be guaranteed for all of those who wish to transit to the airport. Price said countries from Albania to Uganda to Canada have expressed willingness to harbor Afghan refugees. In Washington, Earth Chapman, Boomer Grady. Police in Washington, D.C. have arrested Floyd Ray Roseberry of Grover North Carolina, who threatened to blow up his pickup truck not far from the Capitol. Capitol Hill Police Chief Tom Manger says the suspect surrendered peacefully after hours of negotiations. Mr. Rosenberry had uh, parked a truck and was sitting in a truck for several hours um, in front of the Library of Congress, and um, he had advised that he had explosives. Major says Roseberry appeared to be acting alone. You can count three more U.S. senators in the tally of those testing positive for COVID-19. Republican Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi, Independent Senator Angus King of Maine, and John Hickenlooper of Colorado have all tested positive, even though all of them are vaccinated. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. 
Thank you so much, Nancy Lyons. I'm Carol Masser in our Interactive Broker Studio. Joining me right now is Doug Krisner of Bloomberg News. Doug, mm -hmm. uh, this story by Market Watch over at Dow Jones. According to a new survey, 59% of Gen Z traders claim to have bought or sold an investment while inebriated. Does that surprise drunk. you? No. No, but it's kind of, doesn't it go well, against, like, don't do that? Yeah, maybe, but consider the context, right? I mean, I think th what? there was an interesting piece in The Atlantic a while back about how the pandemic has really shaped the drinking habits of Americans. And I think as of February, nearly a quarter of those surveyed said that they had drunk more over the past year, so that's during the pandemic, as a means of coping with stress. Mm -hmm. So if you got a buzz on, right, and you feel like, <laughs> hey, maybe I want to capitalize on a move in a market, and you, you log on to your your online account and take it away, right? Yeah, but it's kind of like, don't do that. It's like you get drunk and you call an, an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girl. Like, it. don't do that. Don't pick up the phone. Don't text them. But that's the technology <laughs> working in your favor, right? Without well, an intermediary. Maybe in the old yes. days, and I think this the article points this out, right? You may have had to go through your mm -hmm. broker and pass some kind of smell test, as it were. Yeah. Right? And the broker, presumably, would have some level of fiduciary responsibility. So if they thought that the idea itself was a little misguided, maybe they would talk you down from the ledge. Well, I love the story where it does ask that question. Should you have to pass a breathalyzer to make trades on Robin Hood or Charles Schwab? You're right. Like, the barrier to entry, it's so That's easy, right. right? You're just sitting down. You're, you know, And the thing is, it, we stream everything. What's the difference between kind of like <laughs> you're streaming the market or whatever, and you're like kind of playing it as like, almost a video game. Exactly. And if you're stuck at home, there's uh -huh. nothing to do. You're kind of locked down or at least being very conservative. The enticement here to become involved. You, you, I think the video game is a great metaphor. Right. And I think that's what a lot of this online trading activity has become in a way. That's exactly it. I mean, it feels like it's a fun game that you're playing it. The, the, the platform itself feels like you're playing a game. And so uh, what's the response? And this is some of the questions that have come into with some of these platforms like a Robin Hood or some of these uh, uh, disruptors in fintech. Uh, but uh, something to think about. Trade Doug stocks and have an IPA. <laughs> Nicely well done. Doug Krisner, thank you.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. We had a mixed day in the equity market. I'll talk more about that momentarily. We are hearing from Applied Materials now with uh, their earnings or the company's earnings for Q3, a beat on both the top and bottom line. As an example, just in terms of revenue, the sales side, $6.2 billion. The estimate was something from a little more than five point nine. so a big beat on that front. And at the same time, AMAT gave a bullish outlook projecting for the current quarter sales of around $6.33 billion. Interestingly, the stock is showing a little bit of weakness in the uh, late session, down about uh, a tenth of 1%. Now, in terms of uh, the equity tape today, very choppy trading. We have August expirations on options tomorrow, so that typically adds a bit of volatility. A lot of the economically sensitive stocks were down on concern over the spreading of uh, the Delta variant, particularly energy shares. The correlation here, obviously, is on the travel side of the equation. Uh, crude oil in New York was down more than 2% right now in the electronic session, around 64.10. And we had the S&P Energy Group as a whole down nearly 4% today. In spite of that weakness, information tech allowed the S&P 500 to drift higher by about a tenth of 1%. We also had the NASDAQ comp rising a tenth of 1%. And a 10-year Treasury last quoted in New York at a yield of 1.24%. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Dougie, you ready for the metaverse? I am not. Okay, me Can neither. help me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Doug Krisner there with uh, a check on the world of business. There are a bunch of headlines on Facebook today. We have U.S. antitrust officials refiling their monopoly lawsuit against Facebook, looking to really salvage that landmark case that a judge threw out back in June. There's Facebook also removing some 20 million pieces of COVID-19 misinformation. And then there's the story that really made us want to talk to our Kurt Wagner about Facebook's Horizon Workrooms, the company's latest push to move our lives into a virtual world. Let's get into it with Bloomberg New, uh, News technology reporter Kurt Wagner. He's on the phone in San Francisco. Kurt, thanks for being with us. Just quickly, um, before we get into the cool stuff, do we need to know anything or what does our audience, uh, Bloomberg listeners and watchers on YouTube, need to know about the Monopoly lawsuit and also getting rid of those uh, misinformation uh, when it comes to COVID information on the Facebook uh, platform? Yeah, I like how you frame that. There's the cool stuff, uh, you know, the futuristic stuff that Facebook would love us all to be talking about. There are a few other things going on. Uh, I think with the FTC lawsuit, I mean, the, the big thing to remember here is that this is now the second time the FTC has filed this. The first time they didn't do uh, enough to basically prove out their case, and the judge said, hey, come back to come back to us once you've, uh, you know, kind of solidified your, your argument and actually proven out that Facebook is a monopoly. So this is take two. On that, um, we're going to have to see if, if they did a better job of, of making their case this time around. On the COVID stuff, I mean, we've been talking about COVID misinformation on Facebook for a really long time. Um, so this is a regular update that they give. Um, the fact that they've removed 20 million pieces of content. I mean, they do this, they share this because they want people to know they're taking it seriously. It also just reminds us how big Facebook is and yeah. how, uh, you know, there are so many posts on there that can be problematic that even if they catch 20 million, even if they miss 1%, that's hundreds of thousands of posts that are getting missed. So right. I think, um, you know, it's important to pay, to pay attention to that. But to your point, the fun stuff is the, the VR stuff. All right. So let's get into it because you actually got to try it out. I've been looking at some clips of people who have been in it. Um, Facebook's Horizon Workrooms, it's the metaverse. Tell us, we're talking about it increasingly, but what exactly is it? Well, this specific feature is um, a group meeting product. So the way that you might get on Zoom right now and do a video call with a bunch of people, imagine throwing on a, a VR headset and joining a, a virtual meeting. You know, I joined as an avatar. I, I sat at a desk next to other reporters. Mark Zuckerberg actually appeared, you know, for, for 10 minutes to answer a few questions. So it's kind of a cool way to do your regular video calls in a, in a, you know, virtual space. And I was impressed. I thought it was a lot more fun than I thought. Now that it's, it's not necessarily super easy to set up. You mm -hmm. have to have a headset. You have to create an account. There's a lot that you have to do to get there. But once you're in it, it's kind of a more uh, a fun experience, I would say, than just, you know, looking at a computer screen and, and sitting at your kitchen table. You did say, though, an hour felt like a long time to wear VR goggles. I know how I feel just putting headphones on my ear for a few hours. I feel like I would get, after a while, I'd be like, I just want to take these off. 
Yeah, and, you know, I had some issues with the focus, and I don't know if that was a okay. user error on my part or if it's just, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. You know, imagine looking through binoculars for a full hour, right? It's not going to be focused that entire time, and that's the feeling I had. So it is a little bit, you know, I think the technology has a, a little ways to go there, but for the most part, this idea of, you know, being able to look around a room, seeing other people do the same, and, and kind of like see actual body movements from these avatars, I thought was pretty cool and definitely gave you a sense of like being in a space with someone that you don't get from a regular video call. All right. Forgive me. And I love innovation. I love technology. I love all this good stuff. Why would we want to do this? Like, why why do I need to do, like, put myself in a virtual setting rather than just go on a Zoom mm -hmm. phone call? Why, why would we do I, this? In it, like in, a, in like we, a work environment versus a play right. environment. So we have these types of, of questions all the time. What is going to ultimately inspire you to make all this extra effort, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that Facebook is going to have to build, you know, 20 different versions of this meeting product before some people tip tip the scales for them, right? So maybe just going to a meeting with your colleagues in VR isn't enough, but, you know, if they add workout classes and they add movie theaters and they add, uh, you know, concerts, right? Eventually, this this will tip the scales for people. And so I think this is the, just the first of many different things. I think it makes a lot of sense because we're all working from home or a lot of us are. But yeah, I, I don't think you're alone in feeling like this might be a lot of work for a, a, a slightly better version of something that you already do every day. Right. Like I, I just try to figure it out because it, is it always going to be? And forgive me if you already said this and I missed it. But I mean, are we always going to put be putting ourselves almost in like a comic book world, or is it a case of being able to put something in that is much more realistic looking? Well, I, I think that they're working on improving the, the realistic elements of the avatars, right? I mean, even the versions we have now are much more, at least in the, in the facial features, they're much more realistic than they were even a few years ago. So I think that's just a technology problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, you know, the goal is, hey, let's all be cartoons, right? But yeah. at the same time, it has to distinguish a little bit between the real world and reality. It'd be really weird if we were all exactly like we look like in, in real life, right? It has to have some That's kind true. of unique characteristic to it. And it would be a little creepy, I think, right? It kind would of? be. I agree. <laughs> all right. Well, that is the cool stuff. And thanks for also doing some of the news headlines on Facebook today. Kurt Wagner, our technology reporter at Bloomberg News. Check him out on Twitter at Kurt Wagner 8 for all of his reporting on the world of technology. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week, a friend of the show. Uh, Kent Swig is back with us. We're going to talk about the commercial real estate market, a little bit of crypto as well, and maybe even some New York City politics. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser in our interactive broker studio. Coming up, someone that we've reached out to many times over the last couple of years to talk about commercial real estate, to talk about residential real estate, we, to also talk about uh, some of the big macro themes that have been facing leaders. Uh, Ken Swig will be back with us. He's president over at Swig Equities. In the meantime, let's get another check on uh, the world of business. And your top business stories here is, once again, Doug Krisner. Hey, Carol. So uh, let's begin with applied materials. We heard from AMAT after the bell. Company beat on both the top and bottom line. Uh, third quarter net sales at $6.2 billion. The street was looking for something a little north of 5.9, so a beat on that front. And then if you look at what uh, the forecast is for, sales in the current quarter are around $6.33 billion. That's above estimates. So I think generally speaking, it's kind of bullish, but the stock right now is down about uh, two-tenths of one percent in late U.S. trade. A mixed session here for equities in the U.S. A number of strategists, even before the opening bell, were expecting a little bit of dip buying given that sell-off yesterday. Bear in mind, too, uh, that tomorrow we have the expiration of August options contracts, so that created maybe a little bit of volatility. Nonetheless, a lot of the economically sensitive stocks were down on concern over the spread of the Delta variant. Patients now dying at U.S. hospitals, levels not seen since February. On the positive side, we had many of the real estate stocks, also information technology pushing higher. The Dow was down two-tenths of one percent. But on the other hand, both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq Composite picked up about a tenth of one percent. Ten-year Treasury last quoted in New York at a yield of 1.24 percent. I'm Doug Krisner. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Doug. Thank you so much, Doug Krisner, there. So a story in Business Week magazine this week. It's about how landlords from Tampa, Florida, to Memphis, Tennessee, and Riverside, California, have been jacking up rents at record speeds. And they just talk about multiple people applying, some renters forced to check into hotels while they hunt after losing out too many times. It's just one part of the massive real estate market that we like to follow at Bloomberg. So, too, does our next guest. And uh, back with him, certainly a friend of the show, Kent Swig, president at Swig Equities, a real estate development and investment firm. They focus on commercial and residential properties here on the East Coast, on the West Coast. And Kent, uh, back with us on the phone in New York. How are you? I am good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, trying to make sense of, you know, once again, I feel like I've seen this movie before. And I know you and I talk about it every time that there's a little bit of a spike in numbers or a hot spot when it comes to COVID. We see IBM closing New York City offices amid rising COVID-19 cases. We see a lot of companies rolling back, bringing back workers uh, to their offices. What are you seeing and what are maybe the implications, Kent, when it comes to commercial real estate? Well, uh, you, you, you said it perfectly. You know, I feel like we're back on a merry-go-round. Um, I thought we were coming out of this. Certainly by Labor Day, I thought that the office population would be, you know, very much filled back in New York City. Um, I think what's happening is it's a just it's a slow entry back. Um, we're certainly seeing rising occupancy. Um, New York is, you know, well over 70 percent with uh, one vaccine, and and we're we're getting more that way. So. Um, you know, it, it, this really, this whole variant is a result, frankly, of the fact that people aren't getting their vaccines. Um, and those people who are not getting vaccines really are, are, are walking weapons against, you know, all of those who've been vaccinated, all of humanity, and against themselves. So it's incumbent upon us as Americans, as a patriotic thing to do, is to, to get vaccinated. And that would put us in a position where we can reopen in a much safer way. Well, well you know, when you talk about... You know, we're seeing people come back, though, in terms of rising office vacancy. How many offices that were still wide open? Nobody's there. Well, I, I meant rising often office uh, occupancy, if I, if I said it wrong. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Or maybe yeah, I misheard. Yeah. We're, we're still there, but it's, um, you know, we, the occupancy is slowly rising is what I was, was trying to say. The, um, look, I, I thought we would have been, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent by now. We're not. Um, it is getting that way. I think, you know, we're sitting also in the last two weeks of August going into Labor Day. So people are saying, you know, there's a variant out there. Mm -hmm. The weather's, you know, still hot. I yeah. might as well wait till after Labor Day. We're going to go into the Jewish holidays at that point, and there'll be another reason not to come back. So, um, 
you know, it's not moving as quickly, certainly, as we thought. Uh, you know, masking is starting to become more prevalent again. Um, you know, temperature readers are out there. Washing hands is, is certainly, you know, in, in vogue again, mm -hmm. more so than it was. Um, and I think this is all all within our control this time. The virus is the virus, and it's up to us as the citizens of America to become vaccinated, and that is how we will deal with the virus. And, and it's a pretty simple thing. Right. Um, and it, it's, and that's, that's what's going on right now, is those who have not are putting both the economy and hum, other humans at risk. Well, Kent, and forgive me, you did say slowly rising uh, office occupancy. I just wrote it down wrong, so oh. you, are, you are spot on. Okay. Uh, I just want to give credit where it's due. Um, President Biden did, did um, call out the private sector and thank them for what they are doing. Do you think the private sector heads of companies are doing enough in terms of saying, you want to come work or you're going to be a customer? This is what you need to do. Um, yes, I, 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 could we do more always? But mm. um, I think that the private sector has responded very, very intelligently and quickly and, and rather boldly. You know, um, I know for our companies we've required a vaccine, absolutely, mm -hmm. or you have to take a COVID test at least twice a week within 24 hours and show um, that you have a negative test. Um, I'm, I'm pushing towards not even allowing that and just saying if you're not vaccinated, you just can't come into the office. Um, fortunately, for most of my companies, everybody's been vaccinated. Right. Um, and I commend those people, and, um, and they're honoring themselves as well as, uh, as the rest of uh, our humanity in America. Um, uh, but I think I do think the businesses have responded quite well to that, and and that's what it takes. You know, it's it's yep. we need to implore and to all the people to get this vaccine. Is there a dislocation? I think you and I have talked about this before, and I think one of the things that has been so surprising um, is that we haven't seen more problems in the commercial real estate as more you know as people have stayed home. Is there some dislocation coming uh, on, a, on a larger scale, Kent? That that you're anticipating and just got about 45 and then we'll come back and talk some more. Okay. Uh, perfect question. Um, the answer is possibly yes. Okay. Um, and, and the reason is, is because for the first time really um, in our country's history, potentially, we have a, we have a, we have a, a, a shortage of workers. Um, people are finding, some people are finding that they'd rather take a lot less pay and sit at home, not have to commute, not have to buy clothing for work, and they think that they can work from home. That potentially portends a, 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 a slowdown maybe in some of the office uh, uh, leasing that has occurred in the past, but I would say that's more class B and C space than it would be class A space. All right, great, great uh, response. Hey, sit tight, Kent. We're going to come back and talk some more. I want to talk a little bit about crypto, the world, because I know you guys have been uh, moving into that and uh, with a stable coin specifically, and I also want to talk a little bit about maybe local politics. We are talking with Ken Swig. He is president of Swig Equities uh, with us on the phone from New York City. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. Right now, though, it's over to Nancy Lyons in our 991 newsroom in the nation's capital for World and National News. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. The Pentagon says the U.S. has evacuated a total of 7,000 people since operations started at Afghanistan's Kabul airport last Saturday. In the last 24 hours, more than 2,000 have departed. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby says the priority is to evacuate as many people as possible and keep them safe in the process. We're going to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that uh, we can protect our force, protect the people that we're trying to move on to the airport and protect their movement out of Kabul. Kirby says the U.S. has been flying F-18 jets over the Kabul airport to maintain security. President Biden is doubling down on his decision for the U.S. to pull out of Afghanistan. In an interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos, Biden admits he expected things to get messy. The idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happened. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. Biden says American intelligence assessments did not foresee the collapse of the Afghan government in 11 days. He says the prediction was closer to the end of the year. A standoff not far from the U.S. Capitol is over after hours of negotiations. Capitol Hill Police Chief Tom Manger says a man identified as Floyd Ray Roseberry threatened to blow up his pickup truck that was parked in front of the Library of Congress. He got out of the vehicle um, and uh, surrendered, and the tactical units that were close by 
uh, took him into custody without incident. Manger says they're still determining the man's motive. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Joining me once again is our own Doug Krisner. And Doug, a couple of mm. real estate stories. I want to go to this New Jersey mega mall, though, because it has been one problem after another, different owners, uh, groundbreaking nearly two decades ago. It's a mega mall built in New Jersey's Meadowlands. I know it well. I pass it a lot on the turnpike. Has done little except hemorrhage cash, and that includes for its latest owners. So this is the Gramazian family, mm -hmm. right? And they're at risk now, I think, of losing, at least in our reporting, losing losing their uh, equity stake or a big chunk of it as a result of this. You know, it's a case of timing, wouldn't you say? I mean, I think there was a vision behind what they uh, set out to do originally, and then the pandemic struck. We know what the story is. We know how commercial real estate has been impacted. We know what's been happening in the retail brick-and-mortar space. Yeah, it's kind of a very, very sad story. But you do wonder, too, is there something about the location? I know where it is, and I, I do wonder whether it's not. I mean, there are a lot of malls in New Jersey that do fairly well, and I don't know whether it's location or whether it's the concept. It's a shopping and entertainment megaplex, if you're not familiar. Uh, the original developer um, was driven to the brink of bankruptcy, was seized by lenders from the team that came next. And you got to keep in mind, it's not just this family, which runs some of the biggest and most successful malls in North America who uh, are seeing some of uh, the potential to lose money. It's also lenders, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Source Fund Management, and Starwood Property. They could lose uh, or face losses of $1.7 in construction loans as well. But it's, you know, you can go, there's a ski slope, an indoor ski slope, there are passes to a water park. I mean, there's a lot going on there, Doug. So now weigh that against the news that Dow Jones was reporting mm -hmm. earlier today about Amazon looking to open a number of brick and mortar department style stores at locations. I think initially it'll roll out in California and Ohio. Interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, I think this is to Amazon who has increasingly creating their own brands, you know, uh, whether it's clothing, whether it's household items. Maybe it's a way to reach the consumer more directly and I think kind of get it in the face because uh, they're really trying to develop their own brand lines as well. But interesting in terms of real estate developments. Doug Krisner, thank you.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It was a mixed day for the equity market in the regular session and a choppy uh, day of trading to be sure. A lot of that volatility may have been due to August options, which expire tomorrow. Uh, we had the VIX index today above uh, 21. A lot of weakness in the economically sensitive names. No surprise given the concern over the spreading of the Delta variant. Energy shares tracking the price of crude oil or WTI right now in the electronic session down by 2.4 percent. We're trading just under 63.90. A lot of weak data coming out of China overnight as it uh, relates to refinering uh, capacity. And we have uh, today in, in the regular session the Dow weaker by two tenths of one percent. But on the other hand, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq comp each picked up about a tenth of one percent. So there was uh, relative strength among information tech and real estate. But as I mentioned, those economically sensitive stocks moving lower. We had a rally in shares of Macy's, a gain of more than 19 percent today after the department store operator reinstated its dividend and raised its sales guidance. And then after the bell, we heard from Applied Materials. The company beat on both the top and bottom line and gave a bullish outlook for the current quarter. Even so, shares now weaker by about two-tenths of one percent. Ten-year Treasury last quoted in New York at a yield of 124. A lot of dollar strength as we head into the Asian session with the Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index today up more than a half of one percent. I'm Doug Krisner. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Doug Krisner. Uh, Doug Krisner, thank you so much. Macy's, by the way, up about 92 percent so far in 2021. Let's get back to our guest, Ken Swig, president at Swig Equities, a real estate development and investment firm. They've got properties on the east and west coast. He's still with us on the phone in New York City. Hey, hey Ken, when you hear like Macy's, I mean, they're on a tear this year, at least the, the uh, equity trade here. How do you think about retail going forward? What really stays with us, especially after a year and a half where we've seen so much of a move to the upside in e-commerce, yet you still have somebody like Amazon who says, wait a minute, we still need to also, we're interested in opening up large retail. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, retail itself, mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to say... It, it, Hello, it's traders. By the end of the day, I decided to, created nor to sell short euro. I'm looking to so sell at 11677. Um, you know, people Let's see are if I will be able to sell in just that, um, it's before just, you know, it's, they close at this price. Okay? Such realize that they don't need if you still follow this trade, and if you still follow me, you know, just very, very uh, copy this trade and place an order to sell short so, euro against United States you know, dollar. Was used Stay safe, guys. To call industrial is really now just an extension of retail. Um, so it, people are still shopping. People are still buying. I, I was talking to um, a company, uh, Vashon Constantine, the other day, mm -hmm. and and it, unbelievable, their sales are so dramatically better they, over 2020, over 2019, in the middle of COVID. So uh -huh. um, you yeah. know, uh, people are buying very very expensive watches to wear at home, but but nonetheless, they were so. <laughs> Um, it's 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 an interesting period of time. Yeah, it's interesting in the luxury space. I, uh, we talked to a, a watchmaker, to a seller of watches, one of the luxury, the high end too, and they said, you know, basically you'd get into a virtual store and you would be showing watches, a, a seller, to some customer, and that's how they did it, and it worked. And who would have thought? Uh, a few years ago that they would do it and be able to sell something that sells for thousands of dollars, you know, virtually, but they did it. Hey, I want to switch gears a little bit, if I can. Sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the crypto world, because you guys are developing a new cryptocurrencies. It's a stable coin. It's backed by a physical asset. We're talking about gold. How is that going, and where are you in that process? Um, it's not, it, 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 while it appears a lot like a, a stable coin, we cannot define ourselves quite that way. So okay. We don't. Um, but how is it going? It's going. Position open, guys, at 11677. Okay, I'm going to hold overnight. So if uh, you already opened position, we will hold probably overnight this position. It means it will not cost us anything at all because we sold short this position. Stay safe. Um, and it's going well. We're 
one of the unique things about us is that we're, we're based in the United States. And mm-hmm. The coin is Dignity Gold. Um, but we're based in the United States. We're, we're open and, and, and transparent of who owns it. Uh, our attorneys are in the United States. The gold is in the United States. We've got gold backing, um, you know, with a lien on, on, on the mines where the gold rests. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we're voluntarily going in and filing with the SEC for us. So it's, it's a very different way of going about doing it. And in fact, we will also be paying a dividend because we're, we're, we're setting up an investment fund that, that is linked with, with the coin and uh, pledging some of the dividends um, that are, you know, profits will be paid as a dividend to the coin holder. So... Help me out here, because it, it is it is so different from, like, the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. So who do you see yeah. actually buying it? And is, is, is it correct in that it's going to be available at the end of the year, or what's the timeline on this? Um, well, it'll, it, it should be publicly traded, you know, at the end okay. of the year. It's not an initial coin offering, because it, it's just we're issuing coins to people who had a, a previous one. Um, but the, the part of what... I think we're looking at is a different thing. The, 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 dig, the, the digital currency mm-hmm. is, in fact, a digital currency. I think what we're doing is we're taking business practices that make sense um, in terms of governance, in terms of SEC regulation and, and, and uh, review, uh, in terms of real backing, attorneys, et cetera, and then applying it into the digital currency world. Because, frankly, you know, the some 280 digital currencies that are out there, a lot of it, you know, uh, are out there in the wild, wild west of the world um, where you don't know who owns them you don't know the trading platforms you can't find anybody around they're very they're all decentralized um, and and you know it's it's an odd thing to go buy a, a company that you don't really know what it does it doesn't right. perform it doesn't make money etc and it's the greater fool theory that if you you buy it and somebody else will pay more this this has business mm-hmm. practices with gold backing and and procedures and policies and it'll be linked to a fund with dividends being paid etc so it's kind of blending good business you know, from from the old world, if you will, into the digital currency world. You've learned a lot since you learned about uh, cryptocurrencies from your son. <laughs> no, <Absolutely>. seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Um, hey, just got a couple of minutes left here, or a little bit under that. Um, New York politics. I know you're backing Eric Adams. You are all in on him. Tell us about what you think the city needs right now as a leader. Well, we need leadership. And, and, I, and, and, and one of the reasons I, I'm backing Eric Adams is is he happens to be, in my opinion, the right person, certainly at the right time. Um, he, he can walk into the police force, um, having been there for 22 years as a captain, and talk to the police as one of them, and 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 be able to look and say, you know, nobody's there's no human group on earth that's perfect. So we have to recognize our weaknesses and we have to, you know, overcome them, etc. And he's doing it at, with respect and understanding. At the same time, he can walk into the black community and other communities here and say, look. You know, not only do I understand the community, and I've grown up in New York, and, and I understand your issues, I was also beaten up by the police at one point in my life, and, and I joined them to make changes. Mm-hmm. So I'm not looking to ostracize people. I'm looking to, you know, to, to, to work from within. And, and I think that's a very unique blend. He knows where all the street corners are. He knows where, all, all where people live. He knows right. where the communities are. He knows, and he takes a very logical business you know, uh, um, viewpoint of, of how to run well, the city, which well, would be through a business point of view. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Just 30 seconds quick. I mean, this is a city, the, the Wall Street community, the financial community, the business community. Is he going to be sympathetic to it, in your view, the investment community? Just quickly. Well, quickly, the answer is yes, but I'm saying it in a different way. He's going to be sensitive to the New York City population as a whole, which is a blend of all of the component parts of us. Mm -hmm. So he's leading all of us. He's not leading fractions of us. And he can walk in and people and will listen to him. They don't have to agree with him all the time, but they'll listen because he is one of us in so many different ways. And that is leadership with an understanding. And that's what we need. All right. On that note, we're going to say goodbye. Kent, thank you so much. Be well. Kent Swig, he is president of Swig Equities on the phone from New York City. Uh, Coming up is Sound On with Joe Matthew for the whole Bloomberg Business Week team. And Tim Stenovic, I'm Carol Masser. Have a good and safe evening. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.